uh, APSC jointly organized with TAS work group CHIP with or without mechanical circuitry support webinar. A date same today is the 27 November on a Saturday, 8 p.m. Singapore, Hong Kong time. This event is uh, co-endorsed by the Singapore Cardiac Society, TCIP, uh, CMB accredited by EBAC in collaboration with ABIOMET as well as Biotronic. I'm very privileged to have our keynote uh, speaker today, Kevin Kroosh from the US. And of course, you know Eric eckhart -Well, who will be the chief moderator for the session today. Um, a quick disclaimer, uh, this content is copyrighted by the APSC. The views expressed here are those of the faculty and do not necessarily represent those of the APSC. The event is currently made also live streamed by Wonder, APSC Facebook, as well as YouTube pages. CME points will then be submitted for those who are connected throughout the whole duration. You will receive your certificate of attendance upon completing the survey sent by email. Please click on the Q&A boxes uh, if you have any questions uh, throughout the whole duration and uh, the moderators and panelists will try to answer as much as uh, possible. So I'd like to hand over to Dr. Holam now to give a quick introduction to the test group. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Lam Ho. Uh, this test group uh, is mainly focused on those high-risk uh, intervention case. Uh, actually, for all those high-risk case, complex case, we do more and more today, but all are not evident. We don't have enough evidence to support everything and probably we'll never have. So the best way is learning by sharing. So this cups uh, the core values are diversity, inclusion, and equities. We want uh, to receive uh, different uh, people from different countries to express their different opinions. And also uh, include all the, uh, uh, no matter what are the new idea, we try to include all. And everyone are fans and we want to share, everyone are fans and equal. And we want uh, everyone to share their uh, own views in a very friendly manner, just like the ECC. Um, I finished my brief talk. Thanks, uh, Holam. Uh, Eric uh, will then introduce the speakers as well as the panelists. Eric, please. Yes, uh, my pleasure. First of all, uh, thank you for inviting uh, me to this uh, webinar. Uh, second time and second time around, and it was uh, already great success last year. And I see that uh, uh, Holam, who has been the driving force behind this, uh, this webinar, together with you, Jack, have done a great job in, uh, in, in putting this up together again. And I see that we have a big audience of people that are watching us. So, Welcome to all of you. Uh, please don't hesitate to use the chat room uh, in order to interact with us. We are going to try and be as interactive as possible. Uh, and I think that we have all learned to, to use this modern media in these uh, pandemia times. Um, the speakers will be, uh, first of all, Dr. Kevin Coach, who will give the introduction lecture. We have uh, Dr. Chu from Hong Kong. Dr. Coach is from the US. Uh, uh, Wang Bong from Malaysia. Uh, Sidney Lowe from Australia, uh, Dr. Seidler is a little bit closer to my home, he's in Germany, and finally Dr. Sung from Hong Kong. The um, panelists are shown over here, Dr. Chang from Hong Kong, uh, Dr. Christensen is not, uh, cannot make it today, uh, Stan Loki from Belgium, uh, Dr. V uh, Vincenzo Vici from Italy, and then uh, finally uh, from uh, uh, Singapore, Dr. Pham, Dr. Jane, Dr. Jensen, who is a frequent guest, and uh, uh, Dr. Lam. Uh, I would say without any further delay, let's start with the first lecture and I give the word to, uh, to Kevin. Um, I'm very curious to hear about, uh, about your view on complex interventions. And indeed, uh, the evidence that's here is there is some evidence, Kevin. The word is to you. Exactly. Um, great, I'll share my screen. Can everyone see my slides okay? Yep. Great. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to be involved in this excellent program. Um, a couple of points before I start. First of all, the uh, video intro makes me think that the ASPC uh, organization's meetings are a lot of fun. And so cheers. It looks like, you know, it's collaborative, as Dr. Lamb said. The other nice thing about being involved in the complex PCI space, which I really enjoyed over the years, is how entirely collaborative the community is. So in reference to Dr. Lamb's earlier comments, I mean, the nice part about this is in places where we don't have medical evidence, there's a lot of collaboration 
in terms of building best practices and trying to learn as a community. And so over my five or six year professional career in this space, it's been one of the things which I've enjoyed very much. And so when given an opportunity to join early on a, a Saturday and invited by one of our former trainees, Jonathan Sung, I was very happy to be part of this. And so I'll do my best to give you a little bit of a take on my thoughts on complex PCI with and without MCS, really with full disclosure that there's not a lot of data either way, but in the future clinical trials will hopefully help us to inform best practices in this space. As we know, the highest risk patients, those with the worst heart failure and the worst angina and the worst spectrum of disease with left vein disease and three vessel disease are the ones who have the most likely benefit of revascularization. These are also the patients for whom the procedure is more difficult, more challenging, both to get them through safely and also from a technical standpoint. And these are the former uh, US AUC criteria, which really talk about the fact that the sickest patients with the worst disease and the worst anatomy are the ones for whom revascularization is most appropriate because there's the ones that are gonna benefit most. You're more likely to impact someone by revascularizing their left main with global viability in a reduced EF than you are potentially someone who has a type A RCA maybe has class two angina. And so I think there is long recognition that complex patients are the ones really who can benefit from uh, treatment in this space. With that in mind though, there's unfortunately under treatment of high risk patients with complex CAD. This is a slide put together from multiple sources, but it really shows that patients with surgical turndown a large number of them in the US are not treated with PCI and they're relegated to medical therapy for which we know the outcomes are suboptimal. And so despite the fact that we know that complex patients are likely to benefit, there really is not always appropriate treatment of them. And that really is because I think, especially in the United States, there's not ready access to complex revascularization in all geographic areas. And so as we grow as a community, I think being able to increase technical competency is an important part um, in terms of bringing care to patients that are going to benefit. And as part of that, our center and others in the U.S. have really started to focus on complex PCI. And we actually have dedicated one-year fellowships in the space now, really to train more physicians to do what we do in terms of treating the most difficult patients in a way that we can hopefully help to get them better. And so best practices in complex revascularization are done clearly within the context of a heart team. This is supported by class one recommendations by both the American and the European guidelines. Involvement of heart failure, general cardiology, and surgical colleagues in terms of making decisions for complex patients is really clearly best practice. If you look at an experience from our sister hospital, Mass General, with regard to multidisciplinary heart team approaches for complex coronary disease, it's not the syntax score that drives people to complex PCI. The syntax score for either PCI or cabbage patients are relatively similar here. What it is is the STS score, and this just speaks to the fact that complex PCI patients are shunted toward high-risk PCI as a function of their other comorbidities. So we're able to deal with relatively complex disease by PCI, but a lot of what drives patients to us in the heart team context is comorbidities that makes it difficult for them to thrive after a bypass surgery procedure. So really it is important to assess patients carefully. We know when we talk about high-risk PCI, the things that portend worse in hospital mortality are surgical ineligibility, kidney disease, and low EF. And the long-term mortality risks, the things that we really focus on are incomplete revascularization and severe calcification. And I believe that the severe calcification has some part of this, A, because they're more difficult patients to treat, but also severe calcification and really impairs our ability to get good results for patients. And that's where intravascular imaging and judicious use of plaque modification is an important thing that we'll talk about with regard to getting durable results for patients. And thinking about high-risk PCI patients and who might benefit from mechanical circulatory support, really the goal of MCS is to improve the safety and efficacy of PCI in patients who are at high risk for revascularization. We talk about either ambulatory or inpatient patients with having complex disease, and really E is the cardiogenic shock or rest phase of patients that are super sick, and it's nearly impossible to get them through a PCI procedure without some sort of left ventricular support. We know that in observational studies, again, not randomized, patients that have MCS supported cases have more revascularization despite higher risk profiles. And so we know that complete revasc is a benefit to patients. MCS can sometimes help us to get there in super complex patient subsets. So the best practices in complex revasc with MCS are still evolving. And this is one of many publications. Our hospital has its own sort of algorithm on how to deal with this. But if someone's considered for high-risk PCI, and they've got complex anatomy and or comorbidities in the context of a heart 
team consultation, whether or not they get MCS is somewhat related to the anatomy, the comorbidities, and the ability to get it in safely. In scenarios where you can get the MCS in by femoral route, great. If not, adoption of axillary transcable alternative access can be considered. And if that's not possible, use of a balloon pump is still on the table because it is able to improve coronary perfusion in patients undergoing high-risk PCI. The other things that we consider in our algorithm are baseline hemodynamics. Each patient for whom MCS is considered for high-risk PCI will get a baseline assessment of their hemodynamics. This is important for knowing whether it's indicated and also important for knowing whether you can wean the MCS at the end of the case. In scenarios where we're doing retrograde CTO PCI, we know that we're likely going to worsen a patient's ischemia. And those are scenarios where MCS is considered if patients meet some of the criteria listed on the left. And things like valvular disease and baseline lung disease where patients don't have a lot of reserve from a myocardial standpoint, all are part of the calculus, which helps us at our center to understand who's going to get an MCS-supported PCI versus one that doesn't have MCS. And so if you think about this, best practices in MCS have been shown in this single arm registry, looking retrospectively, where use of Impella in high-risk PCI in a study called PROTECT-3 when you look back, these patients were more complicated than the prior studies, but you see that we're actually having better 90-day MACE outcomes because I think we're starting to use these devices in a way which is a little bit more rational, and we develop best practices in terms of access, use, and application of this. And so despite the fact that there's not a lot of data, and despite the fact that this is observational, there are trends toward us doing a better job using these devices in patients that are undergoing complex revascularization. So when MCS need is uncertain, we don't know if a patient's gonna need an impella. Jonathan Sung, who's on the panel, has done this with many, me many times. If I'm not certain, I'll just take the little one French introducer from a micropuncture. I'll put it in the femoral artery. I'll take a femoral angiogram to make sure that if I have to get MCS in quickly, I can, and I'll leave it there for the case. Hopefully I'm not gonna use it. I'll draw my ACTs off of here, but at some point, if we're gonna need to get it in quickly, I can get an impella in or a balloon pump in very, very quickly in a case where I know the anatomy, and I've got access already. And so I will completely acknowledge that although this graph is imperfect, there are patients who are sometimes borderline. I'm not sure if they're going to need it, in which case I'll hedge my bets a little bit and try to have some access in place. The nice thing about these one French accesses is they actually don't have much of a bleeding risk hazard. So you can keep them in and they don't really impart a major access site. They come out very easily at the end of the case with manual pressure. As a path toward evidence, I'm excited that PROTECT4 is going to look at high-risk planned PCI and PELA supported versus without hemodynamic support. And this trial will someday help to inform us with regard to which patients are more likely to benefit from MCS supported PCI. This is gonna take several years to result. In the meantime, we're doing the best we can in terms of observational studies and collaboration in this space. It's also important when we think of uh, high-risk PCI that patients should be considered for complete revascularization. We know that complete revasc is associated with much better outcomes. The nice thing about MCS is it's able to help us achieve complete revask in more patients, especially when they have high risk anatomy. The other cool thing about this is MCS, at least in studies, has been shown to help to get complete revascularization, probably because patients are better supported during the case. Again, this is not particularly randomized to look at this question, but if you go by extrapolation, complete revask is associated with better outcomes. And at least in high-risk patients, MCS use is associated with more revascularization. And so hopefully this can be looked at and protect for as one of the things which will protect patients in terms of getting longer benefit after their high-risk PCI procedure. The interventional skill set in terms of learning to treat high-risk PCI patients is a continuum which goes from basic wires and microcatheter through bifurcations, left main, and hemodynamic support, and how to do this safely is certainly an important part of being a high-risk PCI operator. And at the end of this is CTO, especially retrograde, which takes a couple of years to get competency at unless someone's doing a dedicated CTO fellowship. So with that in mind, we and others have started complex PCI programs for which a large part of the core competency of this is to be able to be facile with hemodynamic support because it's recognized that this is an important part of treating patients that have complex anatomy. We think about complex PC optimization. The other thing about these patients is we know that the lesional characteristics and their comorbidities put them at risk for stent failure and major adverse events afterwards. The interventional procedure really matters. Syntax 2 showed us that if you use IVIS and physiology and you have good CTO PCI success rates, we're able to take high-risk patients and convert them to having much better outcomes compared to patients that were treated in old historical subsets such as Syntax 1. And so the important part of this is it's not just MCS, 
you can't forget about doing the PCI in a high fidelity way. So I have one case which I'll be able to share that I did recently. It's a 73 year old gentleman, class three, four angina, EF is 25%, has peripheral arterial disease and a depressed ejection fraction. And so with that in mind, his high risk PCI was elective. These are the outside hospital films. He's left dominant, has an occluded right coronary artery, multiple CTOs in the CERC segment, and an LED CTO. He's referred in for angina and heart failure. You can see the outside hospital films here. The LED is occluded. We started, he was turned down because he had poor surgical targets. Pets showed global viability. We planned complex PCI. His cardiac index was only two. We did a radial to peripheral angiogram, understanding we wanted to know what the best place to put the impel in. Here's his patch angioplasty repair. We didn't want to go through a scarred groin, which was surgically treated. So in this point, we had a difficult left iliofemoral system, which we were able to address with a seven millimeter shock wave. This is new. This is helpful in terms of treating MCS patients because it allows us to get devices in easier without having to go axillary transcable. After doing the shock wave, we still had a little bit of difficulty, but we eventually were able to get the impella in. We use single access technique, which is using the impella insertion sheet to be able to put in a seven French guide. Jonathan Sung is on the call, has done many of these cases with us. It's cool, after we first published this paper, and my colleague Jason put this on Twitter, three and a half years later, actually, the impeller registry showed that about over 40% of cases are now done with single access. And so it shows the power of collaboration and community in terms of being able to speed innovation in the space. And so one access point allows us to get the guide in and the impella in. We were able to do, we saw that the circumflex uh, was worse compared to the diagnostic angiogram done several months earlier. With the impella in place, we went ahead and opened the OM3. We were originally subminimal. We were able to wire redirect. At this point, we were able to balloon. We had difficulty with balloon expansion. IVIS showed 360 degrees of calcium in this scenario. You can see the IVIS is in there. We were then able to use a shock wave throughout the segment to be able to change the compliance of the lesions. An NC balloon finally dilated okay. We were able then to take an angio, which looked like we were getting improvement in terms of expansion. We put a distal stent here. We went ahead and opened up the OM1. The OM1 was too small to stent. We used a mini star technique, eventually got into it. And after a two millimeter balloon was in, we were uncomfortable stenting this because it was quite small. So we left it like it was. We went ahead then, this is the final result after the stage PCI. This took a decent amount of contrast because we were using integrated wire escalation technique. We used a double post-close strategy. So two per closes after the impella is in to get out. And then we did a final radial to peripheral angiogram to make sure there was no bleeding. I think being good at radial to peripheral and being good at MCS access site management is an important part of doing work in this space because one of the main things against use of MCS Um, I think we lost uh, the voice yeah. of uh, Kevin. I think we even lost the connection. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Actually, his talk contains lots of information. <laughs> we can <laughs> uh, start a bit of discussions. Just take this as a timeout. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, in the meantime, while he's coming back, we can maybe already address um, uh, a few points, of course, I think the, the one point, but very practical is the access to Impella, uh, which is, of course, a very expensive device. And it, um, and, and, and it may, of course, not be uh, available for, for many people. So maybe you have a, a kind of round table. Of, um, let's, let's go around to the panelists who, who has Impella and who, who is using it and who doesn't have Impella and who how is he managing uh, these high-risk uh, interventions? So uh, maybe anyone wants to comment on that. Uh, maybe start with Jack. Uh, Singapore and uh, Hong Kong are rich countries, so maybe you can comment on on it. Uh, thanks, Eric. Unfortunately, not rich enough. Uh, so my center still not trying to bring Impala. The biggest barrier is cost, and my director actually thinks, based on the review of the current evidence, that it's not so strong enough to use it in this subset and there's no evidence for shock. So he, he feels that uh, at this cost and a lot of cases it's quite difficult to adjudicate uh, whether you do need an impeller or not. Uh, so I, I have no experience, so I'll defer to maybe Christoph uh, who wants to make a point. Yeah, let's hear Christoph. Uh... Yeah, um, 
I worked in a in a place where we installed the Impella, and um, um, I think there were so many points in this talk from uh, Dr. Gross from from the states until now that are very very important. Uh, it's the standardized um, uh, uh, implanting of this program and step by step getting used to this uh, device, and uh, from the beginning who you have to decide to, to use MCS on and then uh, uh, until um, finishing the case and then how to close the, the exercise. Unfortunately, now I'm in an ambulatory setting and uh, it is not um, uh, uh, reimbursed in, in, in Germany mm -hmm. in this ambulatory setting. So I'm, I, I'm not using Impella anymore, um, but uh, still I begin with uh, who is the best patient that I have to send up to a different place who uses MCS and who can I treat safely in my setting, which is very important in, uh, especially in this ambulatory setting that no problems occur uh, in this way, especially uh, if we want yeah. to, to treat complex cases. Um, I'm back, I'm sorry about the technical issue. For some reason, the connection uh, dropped out. My apology. Okay, okay. You were just discussing the, um... The, uh, of course, the availability of, of Impella uh, across the world. We have Impella here in Switzerland. Uh, mm -hmm. We just heard from Christoph that uh, he doesn't have access to Impella. Uh, in Singapore, there's no Impella access for the moment also. Um, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Belgium, uh, Italy, we can go around. But um, that's maybe one of the issues, of course, uh, that we are facing. Anyone, anyone else wants to comment? Uh, Stan, how is the situation in Belgium uh, with Impella? Uh, we have Impala access, but it's not a complete reimbursement. So the access is quite difficult. We are depending on negotiating with uh, hospital directors. So it's not a not easy to start a program. It's difficult to have, I would say, sufficient volume to to do the, the learning curve because of I would say limited access. We have done this now since uh, one year and a half, two years. We have uh, done some cases, but um, yeah, it is a very, very interesting and promising device. I, uh, we, I do recognize it's, uh, but we don't have it available, I would say, for all cases. So for, or for all cases, we want to. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin, Kevin, you got stuck in your, your lecture, your back now. Uh, um, uh, we have progressed a little bit over time. Are there some points, a few sites that you absolutely wanted to highlight uh, because we, uh, and I see also Sydney wants to make a comment. Uh, maybe let's go to Kevin first. Uh, uh. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Apologize for the technical issue. For some reason, the internet dropped out, but I'm back on that. Yeah, so, you know, uh, the, the case I showed was just an example of um, a patient that had high-risk anatomy and high-risk hemodynamics. We did the original CTO in a staged fashion because of contrast utilization. A lot of times when the MCS goes in, we tried to do as much revask as possible. But having treated two CTOs in the CERC, I brought the patient back three weeks later. His EF had improved, his hemodynamics had improved, and we did his LED CTO successfully with a mini star technique without using MCS. And so I think understanding baseline hemodynamics, at least is something that we use in terms of who to stratify this to. And so I chose that case because the title was MCS, yes or no, and times when you might use it and might not. I understand that geographically, this device is often too expensive and not widely available. So understanding who the sickest of patients are that will benefit is something that you know I completely respect. And we also have, um, a little bit of a measured approach to this, maybe even more than some centers, because as was mentioned earlier, the vascular complication rates, as Dr. Lochi pointed out, are somewhat substantial. So, you know, there's no free lunch to using these devices, especially in older patients with peripheral arterial disease. And so the, the things that really are in part of our mind in terms of who gets it are anatomy, comorbidities, baseline hemodynamics, and the chances of creating major ischemia during the case. And that gets integrated into a yes, no for patients when we consider MCS use for high-risk PCI. Mm -hmm. One important point you made, and then I give the word to Sydney, is the, is the team approach. Uh, we have set up a, a chip registry at our hospital and, and all the, the complex cases, we discuss them in, in team, well, unless the emergency case in a team spirit, and then we try to define a strategy together and try to stick to that uh, for the, the team that will do that. Um, Sydney, you want to make a point? Yeah, look, we, we have Impeller, and I think that uh, we've broken this uh, issue. Obviously, the protective PCI, it's a totally different animal to the STEMI shock. 
And I think that for those people, at least uh, many years ago, who started in the UK and did a lot of STEMI shock, just got very poor results because STEMI shock is a completely different animal, a lot of death attached to it. And I think we saw some very excellent results uh, in the NCSI. But I think the protective piece that we're talking about, uh, in a way, um, you know, often you don't even know, it's hard to gauge the value because you get away with complex PCI a lot of the time. But I think that I've, having done a few, uh, I really, it's very quiet. You spend a lot more money um, doing it. And I think that actually supports all the organs and you can almost do anything, you can actually complete the reverse. And maybe one of the things is the uh, contrast limit you were talking about. And we've done people who improve their LV so the next time they come back, in fact, I've just done one recently, three years after the original uh, very complex PCI multi-vessel, uh, the EFS improved so much and we didn't have to do use that. Uh, no mechanical support is needed. And when they came back three years later, so it's done very well. So um, you're right. Uh, we're still learning how to do this properly. The team approach is uh, very useful, very helpful, just so everything's vetted. But uh, yeah, reimbursement is the biggest issue. But then again, the large way access, not so bad considering we do TABI now. So. Um, maybe let's hear in Malaysia and in uh, in India how is the situation uh, uh, from Bangu. Uh, Hi, hello. I, I, yeah, in Malaysia. Have, uh, Hi, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, in Malaysia we don't have impella yet, so I think the uh, in terms of uh, managing shock, you know, it is still the intra aortic balloon palm, and uh, the only very few centers have ECMO, and uh, they're usually under the. Uh, cardiac anesthesia. So uh, we've been talking about this, you know, the need to look at the shock team, uh, but uh, really not, nothing has uh, been materialized yet. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Jane in India. Yeah, very good evening, everybody. Now, sir, we have uh, availability of, uh, in, uh, of Impella as well as ECMO in India, but it is not reimbursed. So patient has to pay it out of pocket and they are very expensive. So definitely that limits the use dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I must put it, it's like one or two cases a year for us individually, you know. So it's, it's as good as not being used and we still continue with intraaortic balloon pump and ECMO most of the times. Mm -hmm. uh, the rule of thumb which we have evolved, uh, please correct me if you all agree with me, is that if the left ventricular and diastolic pressure is under 20 and PA pressures are under 40, most often you will be able to get away with worst LV ejection fractions without, you know, impellers. So that's a you know, sort of a hemodynamic understanding we have evolved and we try to use as far as possible. That, that, that's a good point. And I would like to make a, make a devil's advocate statement to, 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 to Kevin indeed. But if the, the patient may be in a very worse condition, but if hemodynamically the patient is stable, uh, the speed of execution uh, execution of the uh, PCI can 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 basically show out that, that the patient is doing extremely well. You can do left mains with an occluded right. It all depends on the speed. Of course, you don't go into any complication because then you may lose the patient. You may consider this this like a Russian roulette, not to have uh, uh, some kind of assistance. But and there is also a point on ECMO and, and EIPB. Uh, definitely, Impera is the best device for the left country, but nobody doubts about that. So maybe, uh, Kevin, any, any comment on, on, that, on that statement? Yeah, I know. It's a great point, Eric. And the thing that I struggle with is it's hard to prove the counterfactual, right? You do an awful mm -hmm. low EF, left main, roto, or orbital case with Impella, and it goes great. You do one without, and it's difficult, but, you know, the same patient might have an access complication. And so understanding a priori who is going to benefit is something which I still struggle with. And so the, the, the times when I'm happy I have an impella in is when I'm actually doing the case and I see the pulse pressure go to zero and the patient is supported with a non-pulsatile map. That helps me understand that, you know, I'm likely getting some benefit procedurally from the device. I've done cases, however, where the patient is rock solid, the impella doesn't look like it's doing anything, and then I have a big leg bleed. And so, you know, that's the struggle here is understanding who is going to benefit is difficult. I agree with you, though, most left main PCIs with reasonably compensated hemodynamics, even if the EF is low, it is OK to get away with uh, just not with IAVP or no support. The hard part is with complicated angulated left mains where balloon crossing is difficult. There's a lot of ischemic time. You're using um, mechanical atherectomy, which obviously is going to 
cause some showering hemodynamic stress. Those are cases where I think there's value to the device and trying to predict with the anatomy, which of those scenarios, not every left main is created equal. You know, the bifurcation ones with difficult recross that need atherectomy are a much different animal than a simple, you know, two stent strategy with no, with no atherectomy. And so the understanding how hard the case is going to be in long is something that we try to integrate. Definitely, that's that's a great point. Stan, you want to make a comment, and uh, maybe uh, Jack, you need to tell us how time is, is going. Uh, if you have to go to the oh, next, probably point. after uh, uh, Stan's uh, comment, we probably have to move on. Yeah, thanks, Stan. I I completely agree with the colleague of India with the importance of the anti-astolic pressure. I think that is often the common pathway to cardiac arrest during the procedure. It's the 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 with continuing ischemia and 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 diastolic pressure that continue to rise, that is probably the common pathway often to arrest and not the hypotensia uh, on on sig. So, we often go to and that is maybe a bit I would say controversial in this area of of doing everything under conscious sedation, but we often go to to anesthesia, full anesthesia procedures, and I have the impression that we avoid a lot of problems in 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 in, in uh, during procedure. I don't know if we, if uh, other colleagues also have that experience uh, because we avoid, I would say the common pathway of, uh, of elevated pressures, hypoxia and rest uh, during procedure. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good point. And if it's a really very high risk patient, you can really have a clear consent and, uh, and uh, it may help out if really things turn out badly. Yeah. Uh, good point, Stan. So, uh, so, Dr. Lochi, I, I completely yeah. agree. We do about 70% of our complex PCI cases with anesthesia, and that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that the patients are intubated. They're just there for deeper sedation than a nurse can deliver in our center. Um, we have a very nice relationship with them. They're part of our heart team. We review these cases with them, and it makes for a much gentler approach in terms of how to do this because if patient becomes hypoxic in case the anesthesiologist knows them, they're there, they can intubate quicker. And again, not every case gets intubated, but in scenarios where you need to convert, it's done in a much more controlled fashion. And so, you know, if, if Impella is expensive or not available, that is a nice other resource to have. If you have an anesthesiologist in the staffing where you can work with them, we were utilizing them so much that they actually added a, 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 a headcount of an anesthesiologist to support our high risk program. And so the other thing about that is we schedule them a little more frequently, maybe if we don't certainly need them so that they have something to do during the day, they're not just sitting around. And so that's been a nice collaboration that's worked well at our center. It's a great point you bring up. Okay, thank you, uh, Kevin. Um, Lam, you want to introduce the, the next speaker? Yeah, uh, next speaker is Dr. Choi Galong. Uh, he currently works in Prince Wells uh, Hospital as an associate consultant. He is a very good operator in both uh, PCI and also structural heart toughies and as well as coronary imaging. Uh, uh, you have to unmute yourself. Unmute. Hey, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So uh, thank you, Dr. Lam Ho, for your kind introduction. So uh, good morning, good, e uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depends on where you are. So uh, thank you for inviting me to share with you a case of severe, uh, I'm going to share with you a case of severe AS with uh, calcified triple vessel disease and poor EF. I'm Dr. Choi Kalong from uh, Prince of Wales Hospital, Hong Kong. So my patient is a 71 years old ex-chronic smoker. He has past medical history of hyperlipidemia, atrial fibrillation, history of uh, left uh, MCA infarct in uh, December 2018, and small bowel and through dysplasia probably related to aortic stenosis with iron deficiency anemia. He also got uh, ischemic heart disease with multiple PCI done before. So he has PCI to circumflex with uh, bare metal stand in 96, and LAD with bare metal stand in 1999 and PCI to RCA in 2001 with bare metal stent. And uh, he was admitted for an ACS episode in uh, May 2020. And at that time, the echo showed a bicuspid aortic valve with moderate AS and a just infection of 45. And they did a coronary angiogram, which showed a normal left main, heavily calcified and torturous uh, LAD with uh, significant lesion in the proximal segment, mid to distal uh, diffuse moderate stenosis, and heavily calcified circumflex with 80% stenosis 
and also heavily calcified RCA with 70 and 80% stenosis. So uh, they did a uh, PCI to RCA with motor shock and four overlapping drug eluting stent. And then they do also three-stage PCI to Cycloplex OM1 and with motivation and 1DS in, in June uh, 2020. And wiring of the LAD is difficult because of the heavily calcified and torturous, uh, tortuosity. So at that time, because the LAD doesn't look uh, super tight, so we, uh, they, we planned for a medical therapy at that time and planned for a stage uh, re angiogram one year later. However, this patient was admitted for heart failure in September two months ago, and the echo showed a severely impaired ejection infection of only 27. The mean aortic valve gradient was 33, and I will show the angiogram later, then it show a normal left main, the LAD uh, was torturous and calcified with 80% stenosis, distal disease, same as before. Circumflex stand is uh, patent, RCA stand with ISL 50%. And then he developed cardiogenic shock while in hospital and requiring an urgent uh, uh, BAV. And we managed to did a uh, piece PAVI CT, which show the uh, calcium score more than 2,000, which indicates the VAO stenosis. STS score is 11 uh, for mortality. So this is the echocardiogram, which show a just infection is only 20 heavily calcified aortic valve with severe stenosis, aortic stenosis, mild uh, mitral regurgitation. So the just infection uh, is severely impaired, mild mitral regurgitation, and also the uh, this I mean the mid uh, antral septal and apex region is uh, actually quite severely hypokinetic and globally there is a severe a moderate hypokinesia. So this is the corner angiogram. So the circumflex stand is patent. The LED is proximal segment. There is uh, severe stenosis. It's calcified, torturous. You can appreciate in airway or cranial view. The circumflex to OM stand is widely patent. And uh, the LAD is torturous and calcified with a severe stenosis in the proximal, moderate stenosis in the distal. So right coronary stand was uh, patent with uh, mid, I would say, a 50% ISR. So we also do the p CT. This is a quite uh, uh, abnormal uh, uh, anatomy. So this is a bicuspic aortic valve. You can see there's a calcification at the commissure. And the intercommissural distance is 25.7. The FTJ is very small. It's measured only 20 millimeters uh, in size with a lot of protruding calcium. So any balloon hitting with more than 20 millimeter balloon may cause annular rupture in this case. So the annulus uh, area is 581.4, which corresponds to a 29 sapient valve. So uh, you can see the aorta is heavily calcified. And this is the delivery balloon working length 32. So if we use the uh, sapien, the balloon should not hit the STJ, which is very small and calcified, only 20 millimeter. So what we use, uh, if we use annular sizing, we would use a 29 valve. But nowadays, in case of bicuspid aortic valve, uh, we usually recommend a uh, annular sizing strategy. But sometimes in this case, I will show you, uh, we chose a 26 valve in the end. So this is the uh, circle method uh, proposed uh, recently. So this is uh, a virtual trancapital half valve of 26. And this is 29. They draw a circle of uh, diameters of uh, 29 at the uh, annulus, three, six, uh, 9 and 12 millimeters above the annulus. So this is uh, 3 millimeters, uh, below is uh, 6 millimeters above the annulus, and above is 9 millimeters, and below is 12 millimeters. So what they use is a called a circle method. So if the circle draw is large and beyond the commissure, like this, uh, 29 would be beyond the commissure, and there may be potential risk of rupturing. So if the circle is large enough to touch the commissure, a ceiling would be expected. Like in the left lower panel, the 26 valve would be uh, sealing the commissure without rupturing uh, at the uh, commissure uh, uh, with heavy calcification here. So if the circle is underside, definitely does not touch the commissure, there will be risk of pump PVL and valve embolization. So uh, this is the uh, review published recently by Daniel Blackman. So it's showing the expert consensus on sizing in bicuspid aortic valve. So in our case, the valve is like taper one. 
So if you have two, like I mean the orifice or the annulus is equal size, then you can just size by the trichus, uh, same as trichus with mouth. If you have an orifice that is bigger than the annulus, then you can size also the same as trichus with mouth. But in my case, you know, you know the intercommunal distance is only 26, but the annulus is 29, so it's like taper one. So we usually recommend a smaller side valve with higher position and ceiling would be expected at the side of uh, commercial. Access is good. So uh, instead of choosing a 29, we choose a, a 26 valve, uh, mini nominal fuel. So uh, the patient actually deteriorated quite rapidly and was in a class four heart failure with SOB at rest, unable to lie fats during the procedures, blood pressures 100 over 40. And despite the diuresis, uh, patient did not improve. So we have to proceed to TAPI, but uh, there's some discussion among ourselves. Should we perform the PCI to LED same section or stage to a uh, later uh, after the TAPI or do the PCI first before the TAPI? And also what kind of uh, medical support to use, no support impeller. But the problem of using impeller is uh, you have to remove the impeller during the TAFI procedure. Should we perform a TAFI first, impair the impeller, insert the impeller and do the impeller support PCI, or do the impeller support the PCI first, remove the impeller, and then do the TAFI in the same section. So this is the debate. And the third one, the third one is the ATMO support. So uh, I will probably leave this to the end of the discussion. So uh, at that point of time, because uh, our government only funded uh, impeller use for more uh, for less than 65 years old, this patient is already 70. So we can't use impeller for the support unless the patient self pay. So we insert the VA ATMO for the hemodynamic support. We can support both the PCI procedures and also the TAFI procedures. But the point to use ATMO is, uh, you know, that will increase the afterload to the heart. And during the most of the part of the procedures, patient blood pressure is okay. So ATMO flow should be kept as low as possible. So during patient, uh, if the patient deteriorate with blood pressure, with uh, hypotension, then you can increase the flow uh, during this period of time instead of like setting the ATMO flow to maximal, unlike the use of, unlike the case in impeller. So we have a dedicated ICU colleague standing behind, be, beside of the ATMO machine controlling the blood pressure of the patient. So we do the cerebral protection device. This is the coronary angiogram. You can see that the LED is calcified. There is a stand in the mid segment of the LED and the proximal LED is very severely denosed and the LED is very torturous. So because last time the PCI wire got stuck in the proximal segment, that time we decided to do the primary role tabulation. So you see the wire actually, uh, we have to use the microcapital to uh, bypass some of the calcium in order to wire to the distal LED and then do the rotor ablation. You can see actually because of the tortuosity, the rotor jumped forward. I tried to get it back, but it didn't come back. The guiding sucked in. I pushed with a stronger force. Luckily, the uh, rotor ablation can come back to the guiding. So the rotor ablation got stuck in the band. So you can see once more, the guide, the rotor ablation jump, rotor ablation jump forward. I have to pull back. The guiding suck in, I push stronger. Luckily, the rotor patient come back to the guiding. So I saw some cases of halfway rotor patient. This come to my mind. So I heard one case that presented in TCT, one case is presented in Singapore. So uh, not the whole length of calcified lesion require rotor patient. So if the risk of rotor patient in angulated torturous segment is, and calcified segment is too high, then halfway rotor patient may be considered. So the remaining part of the lesion can be treated by balloon angioplasty, especially we have short wave balloon nowadays. So in severely calcified and angulated segment, halfway both the patient avoid burn entrapment and vessel perforation. So this is, uh, although a retrospective uh, propensity score match analysis, they chose, uh, they do a 56 intentional halfway both the patient, and they choose 55 propensity goal score match uh, patient for comparison. So instead of doing motor patient all the way throughout the uh, calcified lesion, they do it halfway beyond the bands and they do balloon angioplasty in the remaining part of the vessels. So this halfway motor patient was performed in uh, 65, uh, 63 case. Successful rate for halfway motor patient is 90%. 
Unsuccessful cases is around 10% requiring switching back to the conventional motivation. So no birth and treatment was an uh, preparation in halfway motivation, while in conventional group, there is 5.5% uh, of vessel preparation. After all, the goal of motivation is to modify the calcification to facilitate stent dilatation. Another goal is to do it without complications such as perforation and burn treatment. So you see no burn and treatment in both cases, uh, but um, some 5.5% uh, vessel perforation in conventional motivation group. So instead of doing motivation, step down the burn chains to Steve wire, I try to do the IFAS, cannot pass. So this is the IFAS, you can see a uh, heavy calcified stand, it's underexpanded. This is a relatively normal segment. You can see a uh, calcium nodule in the proximal part. Probably this calcium nodule is hindering the passage of the wire and also the gear down to the LAD. And water patient has already ablated that uh, part of the protruding calcium nodule that facilitated balloon passage. So I do the ballooning of the LAD, and you can see the NC balloon in the proximal segment doesn't open. I have to use a 2.5 shortwave distally and 3.0 shortwave proximally. And then put in two, uh, this is 275.38 uh, uh, DES, and another 3.5.16 DES, and then post dilate with a 3.0 balloon uh, distally and 3.5 NC balloon uh, proximally at very high pressure. So this is the uh, final angiogram. So you can see, uh, although I'm sorry, this is projection overlap with the descending part of the guiding. So this is a good result. So we decide to go for the TAFI. This is the final angel uh, uh, IFAS. You can see the stand is uh, well expanded and well opposed, and it lands just at the ostium of the LAD without protruding into the left mains. So uh, we proceed to the uh, TAFI. So we cross with a uh, AL1 is strict wire. So this is the sapien 3 uh, valve coming in. It's a 26 sapien valve. This is the deployment. Uh, this is the uh, angiogram. And this is the deployment of the valve under rapid pacing. So we use a screw in nick from the neck. And so there's a mild uh, power valve leak and maybe 80 aortic, 20 uh, below uh, ventricular deployment. And the uh, TE show only a uh, mild power leak. I, we also did a re of the white coronary is uh, actually the angiogram show uh, nice results of the RCA despite the patient characteristic. So uh, the post-op uh, echo day two showing only trivial power leak. And the ejection infection improved from 20 to 30 after the procedures. And there is only a mild and mild. So in summary, ECMO provides full cardiopulmonary support during both PCI and TAFI procedures. It increased the afterload to the heart. And therefore, we need to titrate the flow to minimally required in order to support the patient during the procedures. And in case of the start water patient, that case, uh, we have to dye up the ECMO flow to keep the blood pressure because the blood pressure dropped to 60, 70s. So uh, you don't need it fully uh, op op operated, but you need it minimally uh, in order to not to increase the afterload to the heart so, uh, uh, so severely. So uh, in case of severe calcified and angulated segment, halfway voltation may be considered to avoid serious complication. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Um, uh, that, that was a great case. Um, it's indeed a complex situation if you have a bad LV, aortic stenosis, uh, uh, and then also coronary disease. Uh, a very small comment. In, in my humble experience, it seems that uh, the, um, the, uh, you can go into a vicious circle um, because it's difficult to decide if you have to go for the coronary first or for the valve. Uh, we, we, we mostly go, basically we always go for the valve first. Because if you're faced with aortic stenosis, uh, indeed with bad LV, and then uh, you get any trouble messing up with the coronaries, then you lose the patient. While, well, once you have tackled the valve and then you go to the coronaries, in my humble experience, it seems a bit safer. Uh, uh, what do you think? Yeah, um, yeah. It's particularly we use uh, sapien that the coronary access should not be a problem. Yes. So next time maybe the valve first before the uh, coronary. But I'm not sure because uh, uh, sometimes I lose patient 
by rapid pacing in poor EF. And uh, the patient maybe went into like incessant VT and I also uh, lose the patient because of that. So uh, I think I agree with you that uh, maybe TAFI first and sometimes the patient hemodynamic improve and then we can do the PCI even without uh, hemodynamical support. Yeah, mostly, mostly, mostly they arrest shortly once you put in the valve and then you have to go for a quick uh, massage and some adrenaline and then they come back mostly. Uh, we have a little a lot of hands raised up because many people want to make a point. Um, well, let's go with Dr. Pham first. Uh, Okay, thank you. So thanks very much, uh, Dr. Tree, for sharing this case, uh, introducing this halfway rotation um, to achieve a balance of uh, risks and benefits between plug modification and avoiding, I think, the risk of perforation and blood entrapment. I just have a couple of uh, questions. What wire did you use to wire the LED and bring the uh, rota wire in the first place? Was it the rota floppy wire or the rota support? And um, the procedure appeared to be very long. I mean, you actually had to rotablate uh, the LED and then after that, uh, do the TAVI. So was the patient intubated and uh, for, for patient comfort or, or in support as well? Yeah, so these two questions. Uh, this patient is intubated because uh, he is actually in class four heart failure and unable to line the fats for the procedures. So we have to intubate the patient for the procedures. And uh, the secondly, uh, I use uh, only water floppy wire I use a rod horse and exchange with the microcapitals and the water for PY. So sometimes I, I, I think uh, I use 99% uh, is water floppy, but sometimes I will use a uh, water support. Uh, I'm not sure in, in this case for angulated segment, it, water support may do more perforation or not, I don't know. But uh, most of the time we we'll use water support. And the anesthesia? I mean, uh, water floppy, I mean. And, and the, the Okay, uh, Dr. Vincenzo from Italy. Yeah, hello everybody. Thanks for inviting me again. I'm sorry, I'm on call, so I, I might disappear uh, if they call me. Um, first of all, thank you very much uh, to uh, the colleague that has shown a, an excellent case. Um, and it, the importance of sharing these cases is that they are out of the studies. So, uh, he, it's very difficult to make a study and randomize these sort of patients. Um, I agree with Dr. Checkout that I would go first. Uh, I would have gone first with the valve and then take care of the coronary uh, after. Um, as regards the use of ECMO uh, in this case, uh, we have ECMO in my institution, but it's in uh, the cardiac surgeon's hands. And uh, I honestly don't have any experience for this matter. Um, on the first glance, I, I wouldn't be uh, very uh, happy to use it because as uh, the colleague said, there is a little bit uh, counter physiologic um, system. So it increases the afterload. So it's something that you would not uh, uh, want to have. But again, that's the, my two comments and congratulations for the case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe let's go to Alan Chang. Um, yes. Um, yes. So uh, uh, Galong Show is a really uh, fantastic case. So um, I, I totally agree with uh, Eric's comments about the when to intervene both the CPACAD versus the underlying CPAS. I think there's a hot debate, uh, particularly in patients with impaired LV insect fractions. I think that from, from our perspective, it really depends on how the patient present, just like this is really an angina or heart failure symptom. Because at the end of the day, I think in the, in the TAFI um, uh, uh, um, cohort of patients, right, we, we, we can most, mostly treat the, the AS alone, whereas the leaves, most of the CAD, uh, um, just medical treatment, because it really depends on symptoms. At the end of the day, I think AS still have uh, the most least survival benefits. And, and, Another point, in case the uh, scenarios allow, uh, in this case, right, the patient ran into class 3 for heart, uh, heart failures and probably um, uh, a more um, viability studies of the, uh, the LED may be feasible in case allows. But of course, in this scenario, we need to commit to go ahead to treat both. Um, I just saw a quick question uh, raised from some of the panelists. It's about TAVI in newly implanted, uh, uh, impeller in newly implanted 
therapy device. We have a couple of experience uh, uh, doing that. Unfortunately, because the patient crash after therapy, um, it depends on what valve you are implanting. So I think for the Sabian valve, I think um, that most of the time it's no issue. It's only for the self-expanding valve like core valve. If you go back to the impellers, uh, the Abomet families, um, they have some recommendations of how exactly position you, uh, you, you position the impeller because the top of the crown of the cell expanding valve like the core valve, um, the, um, the, um, they will be impinged of the outlet of the impeller. So you need to be a little bit more careful to position your impeller while you're implanting the impeller uh, through the target device. But it's okay uh, for a newly fresh device. I, I, I fully agree with you. I would be very uncomfortable through a core valve uh, with this in trauma. It looks like, you know, uh, yeah. Sydney, you, you want to make a point also? Uh, I, my com comments mostly on the halfway rotor blader. So I think that if your rotor blade is not crossing and you get very nervous on the angle or risk of burr entrapment or wire fracture, then of course you stop. And if, depending on how much you, length you've got left, you haven't fully crossed, of course you can attempt balloon, balloon dilatation. Uh, well, I think one of the strategies is to either get a new burr. The company will tell you, get a new burr, pay more money, uh, or you downgrade the size of the burr um, or turn up the speed. Although it's not recommended by the company, we often just max it out and, uh, and just see if we can cut through it. But, um, but I think I don't like cutting on the same bit of wire for a long time on an angle because mm. the risk of fracture is, and perforation is very nasty. So that's just something you, we, we naturally do. Uh, we don't set up to do half a road blade. We sort of have difficulty or nervous, and we, we put a draw and then try to balloon it. It's it's important to have somebody next to the machine and to 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 run the speed. I, I know we can't do it, but everybody's doing it, and mostly can help us out. And anyone else? So we are more or less on time. We have about a few minutes left before going to the next case. Um, Jack, um, what do you suggest to do? We can take. Yeah, one I one. I think maybe we should uh, go to the next yeah. case. Uh, Eric, what do you think? Unless Kevin has a thirty seconds comment. Yep. Yeah, I know. I was just gonna re re regarding what Sydney said. I was just gonna act to the same. I mean, in this case, it's nice if the burr gets stuck, and you get the IVL there. Great, it's gentler in a sick patient, but a lot of times you still can't get gear to go down. And so. Um, you know, new wire, new burr, burr to 190,000 RPMs is often what we'll do. Um, not necessarily in that order. If we haven't bent the wire, I'll try to rotate on a different part of the wire and I'll just turn up the speed while platforming sort of in the proximal part of the artery before going. And I think you made the point, Eric, that you know, having your tech there just to turn up the, the burr so it's deselling less and getting stuck less. We, we do a lot of work in, in stent restenosis because we've got a pretty busy brachy referral. We still do brachy in the U.S. because we don't have DCDs. And so the time when burrs really get stuck is when you're trying to drill out under expanded stents. In that scenario, we have a lot of experience, unfortunately, and end up just now starting with 190,000 RPMs because it's a place where we know the burrs are likely to decel and get stuck. And so if it's a get stuck scenario, I'll lead with a higher RPM than usual as a way to try to mitigate it. Okay, that's a good point. So um, I, I would like to introduce the next speaker because it's a good friend of mine, if you agree. And if you haven't been to Kota Kinabala, I can tell you that's a place to go. Uh, it's correct, it's uh, Hong Bang who's the next speaker? Am I correct? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, Hong Bang, are you ready to go? Yeah, thanks very much for the kind introduction and of course the invitation. It's great to see everyone. Uh, let me get the... Slide out. Can you see my slides there? Not yet. What about now? Yes. Can you see the slide? Yeah, perfect. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to share a case of a acute left main syndrome. Uh, I know the theme of the night is about you know uh, you know complex. Uh, you know, high risk uh, interventional procedure with or without MCS. I actually have not much, you know, to, to you know, to add. I, I heard the two talks this uh, earlier on it was very good. Uh, so CHIP, I think uh, the definition, you know, uh, include patients with very complex coronary disease and often they have hemodynamic compromise. And these patients are usually very, very, you know, are complicated. You know, they usually have a lot of comorbidity. Either they are very old or they have a lot of uh, risk factors. 
I'm going to talk about this gentleman. He's 82 years old. He came in with uh, two days of rest chest pain. And before that, he had almost two weeks of crescendo angina. He had a couple of missions uh, for similar problem in the year. A bit of dyspnea, but otherwise there's no frank signs of congestive failure. He's diabetic, he's hypertensive, he's in hyperlipidemia. He also has a stage four chronic kidney disease. And being an old man, he's a benign prosthetic hyperplasia as well. Otherwise, he's still a, uh, you know, a old man who live on, you know, uh, he's still, uh, you know, living independent, you know, still able to look after himself. Now, there's the first ECG when he came in, and I'm sure you all have seen similar ECGs when they have uh, chest pain, they have widespread ST depression, and I think the only lead that shows the ST elevation in AVR, and of course, to those initiated, they might actually just walk this off and say, oh, this is just another non-STEMI. I think those of us who know, this is uh, the mother of all infa, I would say, you know, this is uh, an MI equivalent in a left main or a very proximal LAD situation. So he's sick, we can tell a patient who has a tachycardia, uh, his blood pressure is 107, 70, even though he's still got warm hands and feet, but we know, you know, this is a patient at risk of shock. And there's the echocardiography, which shows the LVE, which is a uh, depressed, the ejection fraction is subnormal. Uh, he had uh, the usual loading for dual antiplatelet therapy, and we gave him some intravenous heparin, and uh, he wasn't keen for, he wasn't keen for any intervention at the time. You know, this is a very Asian setting. You know, they, they don't make decisions on their own. They like to call in the whole family and that usually delay things. So fortunately he didn't crash. So after, after two hours, his pain sort of got better. You can see some of the ECG changes are, have marginally improved. And we got him in the cath lab, not in the same, same night, but that this is uh, the next day. So the left coronary angiogram confirms that he has occluded left anterior descending and occluded circs so like a left main equivalent. At the time of the procedure, he's actually pain-free. His heart rate is 80, his blood pressure is 100 over 80, and his blood, his, uh, sorry, blood, uh, his uh, oxygen saturation is 98%. And so there's another view of the LA, LAD, is a total occlusion. And this is the uh, spider view. So you can see the left main is pretty normal, but there is the osteo LAD, you know, uh, subtotal and uh, what is it, the total occlusion after the very short stump. The circ also, as you've seen just now, is approximately occluded after a small OM. Here's the RCA, and the RCA is a large and dominant vessel with a distal, you know, uh, stenosis, look hazy, and the PDA, the PLV, are fairly normal. And you can see this huge uh, collateral supplies the LAD as a circ. So this is a one artery to three territory sort of situation. So I think what happens here, he has probably an unstable plaque in the RCA, and that probably is a reason why he destabilized. So I think that's the culprit lesion, which is an ulcerated plaque, and he's got a collateral rentral class three, very good, you know, connection. I think the uh, rentral classification, you know, talk about the three, the complete epicardial filling in this case, and also the connection grade is uh, almost a direct connection. The vessel is more than one millimeter in size. So in this case, uh, he has a multivessel disease with a, you know, a RCA being an infarct artery. The left main syndrome is equivalent because of two CTOs. He's also got a hidden bifurcation of the LAD D1 CTO. He's an octogenarian, he's over 80. He's got a aborted cardiogenic shock, I would say, uh, CKD, but not in heart failure, but he has impaired LV ejection fraction. So uh, in terms of risk, when we look at his uh, profile, he has a high bleeding risk, no doubt. But we look at the risk of thrombotic and ischemic event, he's also high. You know, uh, but weighing it up, I think the uh, thrombotic ischemic risk is still outweighed the bleeding risk. Uh, the syntax score is 31. When we do the syntax score too. Compare the PCI and CBG. Both high, but anyway, this gentleman, uh, he already out, outward says he doesn't want surgery. He's, he's okay to go ahead with the angiogram. He said, do what we can, but he made up his mind. He doesn't want any surgery, whatever we find. So this is what we decided. So uh, uh, the RCA, you know, uh, we put in a, uh, well, it's a trans radio approach. And uh, we put in a uh, BMW wire. This is my usual workhorse. 
I stood, I stand by some dopamine infusion, and these are acute lesions. And sometimes, even though they are, I would say they look relatively benign, type A, type B, but sometimes one inflation, they get snow flow. And uh, this is what I, this is what I'm now starting to do. I tend to give them some, you know, vasodilator. I, I favor nicotapine, and then I do the first angioplasty. So here there'll be a transient ST change and there'll be a transient bradycardia, but there's no slow flow. So then after that, we just decide to go ahead with the stenting. He had a three by 33 stent and then we just post dilated with a 3.5 balloon. So there's the final result. We got the TME3 flow back. He was in TME3 flow, but we got the, we, we preserved the TB3 in the, in the RCA. And you can see the wire actually can go all the way up to the LAD. So at this point, I decided the contrast is okay. We haven't used that much of it. We decided to go ahead and do the uh, LAD. And being an old man, and uh, you know, uh, he has, uh, you know, was a high risk of bleeding. We don't want to puncture his femoral. I thought, let's give it a go with uh, just using the same puncture. So what I did here is I actually kept the uh, corning wire in the uh, RCA. I took out the guide. I got the J tip wire, the long exchange down, and then I upsized the sheet to seven. You can see a wire there. So I kind of trap the wire out and then I go in with a guy, a new guy for the uh, left. So in this case, I use a, uh, a seven French EBU 3.5. You can see there's some tortuosity, a little bit of challenge to get that catheter down. But, uh, but anyway, we managed to get it down. And so this is the first attempt, you know, uh, anti-grade uh, uh, approach. Uh, we get a pilot 50 wire. I didn't mount it on any uh, micro catheter. This is usually my, my approach. I like to go with a, a, a sort of a gentle ex, exploring the entry point. And, you know, and I, I, I actually got the uh, Pilot 50, you know, in uh, the proximal part of LED. And I thought the wire managed to get to the diagonal. Uh, but I tried hard to try to get the LED, but it just keep going to this branch. So I thought at that point, because I reviewed the, I reviewed the, uh, you know, the collateral shot. I thought, you know, uh, you know, you can do a little bit of balloon angioplasty that might that might facilitate rewiring the LAD. But anyway, the wire somehow, uh, sorry, the balloon somehow got got the difficulty going down. Even though it didn't look too calcified, it was a very small balloon, just a one one by eight millimeter balloon. It managed to advance into the LAD, the body of the, of the CTO, and then I did inflation. And uh, the balloon actually bursts. I think it bursts, and then you can see there's a bit of stain around that artery. But of course, it did actually stain the pericardium. It wasn't a large pericardial fusion. His blood pressure was okay. So then, of course, uh, I decided this time let's go with a microcatheter. So I got a microcatheter down on that wire, and I felt a little bit of resistance. I pushed it in, but still managed to get it down. I'm quite confident that it is still in the diagonal. But anyway, for a better support, I think there's a, probably a, some calcification of very, very fibrotic plaque. I changed it to a stiffer wire. I use a, a Sahi Gaia. I got it to the diagonal. And then I try, I try again. So this time I managed to get the microcatheter you know, uh, into the diagonal. And just to be sure, because here I don't have a catheter in the RCA to uh, to do any contralateral injection. So I decided to take out the wire and inject it, you know, into the, inject into the microcatheter to confirm that. So I confirmed that the wire is in the diagonal. Then I put the uh, softer wire back into the diagonal and then I reattempt again the uh, LAD. So with that wire, the diagonal and the wire, the retrograde wire coming from the RCA in the LAD, I know the length of that CTO that I want to bridge. So uh, then I, I managed to get that wire now going to the LAD. And then uh, again, just for safety, I pushed the microcatheter into the LAD and took it out and do an injection just to be sure. And so then of course, I just take out the wire and put the, uh, uh, what I call it, the uh, BMW down. So then uh, the rest of the procedures are pretty, pretty straightforward and uh, managed to do a balloon angioplasty. Initially, again, the difficulty with the one, 108, I use a new 108 balloon and then I size it up to a 20. 
I'll show you the first result after the balloon angioplasty. So you can see there's still some recoil. And I think LAD is at least a 3 O. So I, I took a larger balloon. I used an NC score flex. I didn't do any IVUS. I uh, didn't do any intracoronary imaging. I thought the uh, vessel looks, looks quite you know, big. Yeah. So this is after the scoring balloon. Here the section, some recoil. So remember the lesion was all the way out to the osteo LAD. So I did balloon angioplasty all the way up to the osteo. And then also balloon angioplasty to the diagonal with a 2 balloon. Okay, this is the final result of the balloon angioplasty with both the LAD and the diagonal. Now, of course, there is some recoil, there is you know, dissection. But those of you who probably heard me gave some uh, talks before, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a believer in the drop balloon in CTO. So in this case, this patient tolerated all the balloon angioplasty. We know that because the RCA is not patent, and I know uh, he he has no issue when I inflate the balloon up to two minutes. Uh, blood pressure was okay, so I decided not to put a stent. But I think CTOs tend to have negative remodeling, so I prefer to treat this with a DCB. I use a three point five forty from the osteo all the way to the LAD, the mid segment. So this is the final result. So I left that the, the section. And I plan to get him back to do some repeat angio to see the healing. So there's a the result. Okay, so he did okay. So he he stayed another night. Uh, then he went home the next day. His ejection fraction actually was okay, 45%. So here's a patient. In this case, of course, uh, I didn't use any of this, uh, you know, uh, equipment. Uh, not, not like the previous case. So this is, I would say, a. Uh, a sort of a more simple end of a chip. Uh, there was some tortuous excess, but I think in this elderly, we managed to finish the job keeping to a single puncture, the radial artery, and we used the scoring balloon. No, no need for a mechanical support in this case. Uh, so it's a case of acute left main due to a vulnerable RCA plaque in the patient who has probably pre-existing LAD circumflex CTOs. The primary target here was just to treat the RCA to prevent reocclusion which you risk of shock and death. And PCI to the LAD CTO here, just to sort of secure the coronary supply and reserve. So in this case, uh, it's a unique, I think, because uh, it's not common to see this, or so entrop three collateral with a full grown vessel with a collateral that you can put in a workhorse wire without any fancy CTO wires or micro catheters. In this case, as I said, uh, we avoided the second puncture of femoral and uh, we just do a contrast injection via the microcatheter to confirm the lumen. So a uh, chip, uh, as we said, could be, you know, a clinical, a clinical setting, you know, a high risk patient, like ACS, a shock. And in this case, it was a botted shock. Uh, coronary anatomy can be complex. In this case, relatively, I would say the RCA is was a simple lesion, but the LAD is a challenging CTO. Uh, and of course, hemodiabetes patient is quite stable. So I keep it simple in this case. Uh, I think that's uh, something that we ought to remember. Of course, the cases that you all have shown, there's no way you can keep it simple. Eh? So that's it. I'm a, very, I'm a very simple person. I show you a simple case. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Not so simple. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I see many raised hands. Who wants to start? Uh, um, uh, Alan? Alan from Hong Kong. Yes, yes. It's really, uh, uh, it's really the first time I see a kinds of retrograde with single access with a single Y bearing wire. coming out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just want to point out one, uh, one, 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 one point. So, so it's, um, it's, uh, sometimes uh, it really depends on the uh, the uh, the, uh, the retrograde channel. In this in, in this particular case, the apicado channel. So, um, I think um, for the audience, they need to be aware and. Um, not every case um, can, uh, can can be can 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 be do it like that because uh, we encounters especially for a little bit more torturous epicardial channels. Once you pack the wire down, they easily get spasm. And yeah. um, in case uh, you get have a very uh, significant retrograde flow to the LED, and uh, the patient may get ischemia. So um, this is this is only, the only only comment. But uh, otherwise, uh, it's the the perfect case. You're mm -hmm. right. You actually saw that when your wire go up, you see the apical side. There's some some sort of a, you know, sort of accordion effect in the uh, artery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Dr. Pham from uh, Singapore, want to make a comment? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Dr. Liu, for sharing this excellent case, um, highlighting this Zen approach. Uh, I just want to find out, uh, this patient actually has essentially uh, occlusion of the left system, and then you see that the corporate lesion is in the right. So, um, personally, I just want to ask the panel, would anyone have actually gotten some form of uh, access and like a standby for or IDP empirically, you know, or, or in parallel uh, in some countries uh, before doing the PCI. Yeah. Just in case things turn south. Uh, yeah. yeah, so, so is, I mean, I know there's no guidelines for that, but anybody, yeah. operators who have actually put in- You're, like, you're right. If I may, you know, I, I, I wrote a couple of uh, remarks on the slides. One was, I stood by some dopamine infusion you know, just put it in a syringe and just in case. And, uh, you know, uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, we, we, we have a cold blue system. We actually told the institute to say, please stay, stay close. We might call you. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, these are patients that we, we had to talk to them. Of course, in his case, uh, he was uh, stabilized in some way. Uh, but we had to talk to the family, talk to him about the potential risk of patients collapse on the table. And in my setting, we only have a balloon pump. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when that situation happens, we know, you know, uh, there's very little you can do. Mm -hmm. Because you can close yeah. and all these things, all that standby. I don't know whether, you know, you all have that. I think those are things that are good, good to have as well. Uh, maybe let's ask Dr. Jane uh, if you would uh, do any assistance here. Uh, uh, can I make a comment to the comment from Dr. Pham? Uh, honestly, I couldn't hear because of... Can, can you repeat the... Uh, so the question of, of Dr. Fan was if they, you would consider any assistance, uh, uh, particular assistance in this patient. No, 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 no. I would just do it the same way. I would not. Okay, okay that's very clear, straightforward. Um, we need to go on. I think yeah. we can take one more question. That would be or uh, Kevin or uh, Lam, but I think we need to ask to Kevin because he is our host. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks very much. No, I, I just, um, you made a really nice point, Eric, earlier about the speed of the intervention with regard to whether to get MCS and looking at that right coronary artery lesion. I mean, it, to your point, Dr. Liu, it's relatively quick. You know, if you're, if you're careful with it and you nicely outline the risk, the risk in that case is no reflow, in which case you would have overt hemodynamic collapse. And so it seems like you were prepared for that. I might've put a one French placeholder in the leg just in case. So if something bad happened, I could do it quickly, but you know, it's a really easy right coronary intervention, assuming you don't get no reflow. And so I think speed and expediency there are in the favor of the patient and in favor of keeping it simple as it worked well in the scenario. Well, that's a good point. No reflow can be sometimes terrible and some, not, not always unexpected. It's, it's a funny, crazy thing to have. Eric, uh, I know it will press our time, but this case is wonderful in many levels. Can I just ask <laughs> yeah, some questions ahead. of Hao Bang? Uh, I think it's also uh, Vincentio's question is, I, I haven't tried this approach, but what is your experience? When do you bring the patient back after this? Do you need to? Or you just go clinical once you DEB a CTO like this? And also uh, a quick one about yes, the granule I, I plus. I tend to bring him back. I think uh, I at the moment I tend to survey all my LA, all my CTO that I treat with DCB. Uh, I usually bring them back around six months, unless they have a renal failure. Uh, if they have a normal ejection fraction, I get them on the treadmill. But otherwise, I usually do an echo surveillance and angio surveillance for all these patients. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wouldn't do anything for the Cirque. He's 80 something, unless he's going to run a marathon. So I'll see how he is. Okay. Sorry, Vincenzo, we need, we need to really go on. Otherwise, uh, we compromise time for the, the other speakers. That's fine. Uh -huh. That's fine. I, I, I've got my answer replayed. So that's fine. Okay, perfect. We hold you for the next. You, you can counter, counter uh, Sydney, who's the next speaker. So we're going down south, uh, far south. Uh, and East uh, Sydney, are you ready? I'm ready, thank you. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, can't find my presentation. Hang on a second.
So thank you. Can you see my slides? That's good, Sydney. Please okay, go ahead. Thanks. So conflicts. So um, there's a case, 72-year-old lady who presented to a peripheral drainage hospital of ours with a cath lab, uh, but without cardiac surgery, with chest pain, a background history of uh, drug eluting stents to her LED, three of them, 17 years ago. Blood pressure was okay at the time. The background history is she's diabetic, has hypertension, paroxysmal AF, uh, chest fast cause four on rifloxaban, three, three cipher stents from the ostium of the LED to the mid LED 17 years ago, uh, some hypothyroidism, but ha has cancer. Renal cell cancer, left nephrectomy uh, eight years before, uh, liver mets found three years ago, and uh, two years ago had uh, multiple lymph nodes in the retroperitoneal space, liver mets, right upper lobe and lung, um, right, lower li right lower lobe as well as a fourth rib lesion. The right lung biopsy was uh, shows poorly differentiated adeno adenocarcinoma. She was started on some tyrosine kinase inhibitor in 2019. And then she was relatively stable to disease progression early this year, a progression in the lung and also right hip uh, in May and had x-ray therapy, and then started on palliative intent uh, nivolumab. Immunotherapy was commenced. Uh, but her chest pain with ECGs, uh, uh, like Kong Bax's case, left main looking ischemia, lots of ischemia, left main, left main equivalent. Uh, and she had an angiogram done and you can see that uh, there is uh, a calcified lesion in the distal left main straddling across the bifurcation. There is some stenosis uh, in the LED stent uh, proximal to the diagonal, but you know, pleasingly the cipher stent is still going. And um, it was a 2.5 millimeter stent, uh, three of three 2.5 millimeter stents. And you can see that this is the RAO view. This is some, some disease in the circumflex. Um, and there we go, it's the stills of those pictures. So during the angiogram, uh, they only used 35 cc, so they didn't do a right heart catheter. Creatinine has increased acute kidney injury on a background of mild uh, to moderate renal dysfunction. Creatinine is normally around 150. And her LV, LVDP, sorry for the spelling, 47 millimeters was done in that case. Transferred to my hospital for consideration of bypass surgery. Her troponin was elevated to about uh, 1,700. Reviewed by two cardiac surgeons, it took a little while, over 24 hours, but it was largely turned down due to just her overall state, her cancer and palliative cancer intent, and most likely her residual kidney has a metastasis in it, and they didn't feel that she was going to be very good for a, a good long-term outcome. Her SDs improved a little bit, but then she became unstable about uh, two days after transfer, and she was on IV tyrofiban, heparin, she had some heart failure, pulmonary edema, and was given CPAP. Ventricular, she had gone into AF, uh, I think she was in science rhythm originally, and gone into atrial fibrillation with a fairly rapid rate, um, and, uh, and by definition in, in shock, and uh, with uh, elevated ECG changes now that she's quite rapid. IV debuting was started because it was hypotensive, and it was given amiodarone infusion. I was just going to say that, uh, well, you know, she had an infarct, this is really STEMI shock, or just recurrent ischemia, and we know that, uh, you know, whatever classification, you can get to a cath. But one of the learnings is that uh, we need hemodynamic data to make the decisions. And so in their NCSI experience, they do a lot of PA catheters uh, and also leave PA catheters in to see how patients are doing. Um, we have not done that over the years. I think uh, we're now in reinventing it, particularly for protected PCI. And I just showed this because uh, Kevin had, in his lecture had mentioned protect two and three and knowing that the, the results was that uh, even PROTECT3 is a non-randomized cohort, is that there is a, a trend towards, a significant trend towards reduced MACE events after the event. And of course, you mentioned about PROTECT4, which is going to be a randomized trial looking at support. Um, largely, it is difficult to get case selection. Uh, these slides, it's a couple of slides I've got from Jamie McCabe in Washington Hospital Center in Seattle. And basically looking at, as you say, up, up to 80 protected cases using mostly impellers, and then 85 not consecutive non-supported PCIs around 2016. And look, notice that mostly the protected ones had low EFs, and really case selection's always been difficult, but they have a, an algorithm. But regardless, uh, the trend is that these people have a, a, were a higher need for atherectomy, uh, it looks like, and then EDPs 
uh, generally uh, higher uh, in the, uh, the ones that needed uh, MCS. But they, if, even though they use a scoring system, including severe over dysfunction, uh, mushroom vegetation, CTO, protected atherectomy, single surviving vessel, it is difficult because this is kind of the statistic they use from their model and the prediction isn't great. And so I think we still struggle with which cases need support. Sometimes, you know, this sort of schema from Mount Sinai, if you really think about it, uh, low EF is one of the main drivers of whether you need uh, to have protection. But Or the other thing is about ischemia, left main, severe left main, or risk of uh, prolonged ischemia, due occupancy with CTO retrograde cases. So this patient was discussed. However, when he, she became very unwell, there was no formalized heart team discussion. Lots of talk on a Friday afternoon about do nothing, um, the ICU doctors had said that they would not offer her ECMO um, and that it's inappropriate. The surgeons were not uh, keen on this, and uh, but they would offer CVVHD or dialysis for a little while. And so a uh, long discussion over <laughs> about an hour or two. And then he, she became, uh, she was intubated and, um, and we decided about doing a high-risk PCI. This is her LV function and there is some moderate plus mitral regurgitation. The impression was that there was no uh, major thin nut wars from this and that a lot of it looks viable, particularly lateral war here and a uh, good chance of recovery. And so we had an anesthetic team and we had bilateral femoral access deciding which leg uh, to do at least a balloon pump and the balloon pump was inserted. We talked about a right heart cap, but didn't do one. We did do the LVDP, it was 45 and, uh, and we proceeded to the uh, intervention. This is a seven French guiding catheter and you can see there was some trick uh, some difficulty wiring the uh, left main LED. Uh, very eccentric plaque, looks like almost a, a calcification straddling across it. Uh, and you see that this is uh, this rock. And so uh, we rotated uh, a two millimeter burr from the left main to the LED into the stents. It actually took a little while, but uh, this is the more or less the polishing run to the middle part. Well, the pump was working reasonably well. Um, I have to say that I found that during the case that actually I was the one uh, responsible for putting in 2.5 millimeter cipher stents in an LED. I felt a bit embarrassed by all of this. And uh, the IVIS has showed obviously very undersized stents uh, in the LED from a distal to the proximal, whereas at least a four millimeter stent uh, vessel that I undersized many years ago without imaging. This is kind of what it looks like after the left main to LED rotor. So this is kind of the run of thought I just showed very fairly quickly. You can see sort of calcification, maybe intramicral segment, rotor signature perhaps. This old stent here looks reasonable distally, but uh, look definitely undersized as we come overlapping stents, definitely undersized here. Some plaque in it, and you can see that at prox posto LED is quite small. Road blaze signature here in the left main. The left main is very big. This is six. Okay. So then I try to put the, um, I put a wire down the circumflex and try to do pre-interventional IVIS imaging and uh, really didn't go, but uh, it, very far into the lesion. But as you know, that that was very tight and the vessel looks pretty big to me. So I took the same burr and put the 2.0 burr in there. And then we basically proceeded to uh, do balloon dilatation with a four millimeter balloon in the proximal LED and then uh, performed this some calcification you can see on the clear stent and drug looping balloon the left main to the LED, mostly the osteo LED. And then actually just a non-compliant 3.5 high pressure inflation in the uh, left main to circumflex and IVUS both sides. This is the end result. We only used a small amount of contrast. The patient was extubated two days post and had dialysis for three days. Eventually iodotropes were weaned and microgurgitation improved on echo and discharged a week later, uh, we were, didn't have new sets in. So we actually, we didn't use triple therapy, just clopidogrel and rifloxaban. And at three months follow-up, she's still stable at having uh, monthly nivolumab and ongoing uh, follow-ups with her doctors. So I'm going to stop sharing there. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Great. So I think uh, we can discuss this one. Yeah. Yeah. I, every case is different. That's that's nice about this uh, this webinar. So um, <clears throat> maybe Stein, uh, uh, are you there? You want to make any comment? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, first of all, congratulate on a great case. I think it's a yeah, absolutely fabulous case. Um, uh, I think, first of all, I, I looked at, when I saw the echoes, I looked at the RV, when the RV would have been very, very poor, uh, which we often see in those intubated patients with our respiratory distress. Honestly, I think it, it would have been more difficult doing the procedure, honestly. That is one of the first impressions. I think then you would have been pushed for ECMO. That's the first thing I, I would have... I, um, secondly, I, I think it was very wise to intubate this patient uh, if it was probably necessary because of the pulmonary edema. But I think this patient absolutely with her LVDP of 45 needed intubation before going for this kind of uh, procedure. For the rest, I think it's it's a very nice result, and it, uh, I think uh, most of us would would have gone for a, a lesion preparation uh, with a with a rota or, or something else before uh, going for this left main. For the rest, I think it's a very nice result. Um, personally, in in our in our center, I think with that with that LVDP, I think I might have pushed for Impala, but it, with her oncological status, it would have been a I'd say a long team discussion. I think uh, also. Perfect. Uh, you want to make any comment, uh, uh, Sydney? Or well, I, I to... totally agree. I think whether you uh, would have made, I, I think doing the case, uh, I think that I would have been much calmer with, with the impeller in. There is no doubt. If there was in, you can almost do anything for a number of hours without much, and you know, knowing that she's getting great organ protection and you can even, don't need a pacing wire, et cetera, because she's left circumflex dominant as well. And so uh, her right coronary uh, is non-dominant vessel. So from my point of view, it's uh, having impeller win, nice and quiet, expensive, but it would make me as an operator feel uh, very comfortable doing that without anything. And if you had no reflow and she would crash on the table, would not be a very good time for the operators yeah, or the patient. Vincenzo? Uh... Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, to Sydney, uh, first of all, congratulations, it was a great case. Um, why did you go straight with the 2-0 bear? instead of yeah. going to the smaller burr and then upsize higher. And yeah. the second comment, um, uh, what do you think of IVL in this specific case? Yes. Mm. So, um, so number one, uh, the left main was, looks massive vessel on the, uh, on the angiogram. And, the, uh, and I thought to myself, actually, I, I, I have put 2.5 millimeter stents there. And so I would rather cut them with a 2 over. I wasn't, I was very comfortable with a straight traje trajectory, even though it's a very eccentric plaque uh, from the left main to LED. So I would take a two-o burr there and an Iverset. And notice that I did not decide that's the burr to use in a, in a circumflex without Iversing it. So when I put the Iverset, even didn't go, didn't cross completely, I could see the vessel size. I was pretty comfortable with a two-o after the Ivers. So I then use the same burr. Otherwise I would have used a much smaller burr in the circumflex. But mm. uh, for the left main LED, I had no problem with a two-o. From IVL, IVL, I think that, I checked this after balloon dilatation and I achieved uh, uh, the areas which were quite large. So in Australia, it was like six, even though it would have been bigger, but, you know, except the six. And I ballooned up with a four millimeter NC balloon. And since uh, a lot of that's under expansion, I, I don't think I needed to really crack anything. So I didn't use IVL. IVL in a cipher, that would be a world premiere, I think. I have <laughs> never seen <laughs> uh, uh, Christoph, you want to make a comment? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sydney, for sharing this excellent cause and uh, uh, this case. And, um, and I'm always impressed um, how complex these cases are on, on, on so many levels. Um, and I would like to stress the point uh, on, on, on uh, corner imaging that you, that you put out and, and saw these undersized stents. And this can happen even to very experienced uh, operators that you think uh, you got it right, but you're awfully wrong. And uh, this is a subpar implementation uh, on, uh, uh, of stents that uh, can cause trouble in the in the afterwards. So a uh, great case. And uh, thanks for so having this open uh, um, sharing of uh, even if, if, if it was your, um, your implementation. Uh, what happens, right? The other thing is, um, I did I understand you correctly that um, you did the rotor from, from left main, LRD, left main, circ, and then just did a boba on uh, left main to circ and left the left main uh, untouched without a stent? 
It's just, uh, correct. It's just, no, no stents. Uh, drug eluting balloon from left main to LED, or mostly just out a little bit in the left main because wouldn't have touched. Uh, it's a four oil drug eluting balloon. And the uh, NC35 in the circumflex. And I did IVUS afterwards. I'm afraid I didn't show you, but I IVUS both and it achieved lumens uh, acceptable. And I, 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 I left it with minor, minor dissections there in the circumflex. Comfortable enough for me. Not, I didn't put any stents in. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, I, personally, I, I would have be very reluctant to, to do a rotor and then do not stand it, but <laughs> just me. It's a big vessel. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think one thing the left main is very big, and I not would alone, probably fail not to get alone. a position. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I think I, I'm really apologize to all the raising hands. Uh, uh, but I think we need to go on. I, I get the message that we need to go on. And, and basically, we need to listen to Dr. Sadler now in, in Germany. Uh, I also apologize to you, uh, Tim, that we didn't get you involved in discussion before, but we'll, we'll catch that up. So the next speaker is Dr. Sadler. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, first of all, thanks so much for having me today. It's the first time in this uh, prestigious round, and I'm I'm really uh, amazed by the um, by the talks and uh, the number of ideas that came up. So that's that's really great. Um, appreciate that a lot. Since it's the first time I'm here, uh, I just give you a very very brief introduction. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is Google Earth and where I'm coming from. So it's right in the middle of Germany. It's, uh, it's called Göttingen. That is an old university town. And Google Earth uh, says we have 20% students. So it's great to, to live here and to work. <laughs> okay, so um, I have a bit of a history with mechanical circulatory support. I don't know whether you recognize this device here. Um, I don't know if any, any, anyone knows or maybe everyone knows. Um, I, I, I can... Uh, Exactly, it's a, it's an Edwards uh, Edwards THP, so that's an impeller clone, if you like. And anyone who used it before, it, it was briefly on the market in 2016. It sounded like a plane landing right next to you, so it was so loud that it was really absolutely disturbing using it. But I, I thought it's great fun to show this uh, this old case here. It's a, a CTO of the of the LED I did. But it's not the case that I, I wanted to show. Um, we, we also do a lot of um, ECMO um, because we are part of the ECL shock um, uh, consortium. So this is the same uh, guys who did the IABP shock trial. And now we have the same basically with the ECL shock. So um, of course, it's a different situation in shock with mechanical circulatory support. Um, but um, it was a little bit hard to find a case with impeller. Um, so I thought I this time show a case without mechanical circuitry support because I imagine that everyone else would show one with. So um, I was a little bit wrong, but anyway. Um, so um, let's jump into the case. It's an 84 year old male. Um, he has chronic angina level three. Um, he is a known three vessel disease with long history of reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. And he has a CRTD since 2005. There's also atrial fibrillation. And he was admitted acutely with an VT storm. Um, and in fact, he had uh, 20 shocks coming from his um, implanted device. There was also severe congestion. Um, there's even a, a, a quick ultrasound from his lung with, with, I think, nine or 10 curly lines. So he was um, clinically and also um, with imaging in, in congestion. He was considered to have an acute coronary syndrome. I mean, this came from the dynamics of the troponin. Um, of course, this would have been dynamic with 20 shocks, and it's a bit hard to tell whether this goes back to a plug rupture or not. But he was admitted um, to the cath lab um, almost immediately and discovered to have a 95% mid-LED stenosis, which was uh, taken care of uh, acutely. And this went without complications. So after this PCI and some, um, some amiodarone, no additional ventricular arrhythmia episodes occurred. And uh, six days later, um, we took care of a residual and calcified disc left main stenosis. Uh, that's Medina 111. And before I show you the case, I just go to the, to the echo. Um, I, I guess you, you would agree that the uh, ejection fraction is, uh, is markedly reduced. 
Um, it was, I think it was calculated to be 25%. There is certainly uh, only very little septal movement. There's a bit of lateral um, inferior wall is also severely diseased, but the anterior segment may be an anterolateral. Um, there's some viability there. Um, so uh, another, another problem with this guy is that uh, he has left dominance. So the right corner artery obviously is, uh, is very small. And uh, this is the first picture here on the right um, that displays the, uh, the main problem. So we have a distal left main. We have also a significant marginal branch here. It's not a trifurcation, but it comes close. And uh, so, yeah, that's what I um, decided to take care of. And uh, to, to, con to, to, to really make a judgment on the strategy, I did an IVUS first. And you can see that it's certainly not a 360 uh, calcification. It is, uh, there is some, uh, some calcification there, but it's not uh, so severe. So I, uh, I tried to get away without uh, rotablation. Uh, that's the pullback from the LAD. And on the right, you can see that I was not able to enter the circumflex artery um, because it was so narrow. And, um, and then comes the decision in this case pro and con mechanical circulatory support. And um, of course, pro MCS is the uh, reduced ejection fraction, um, the left dominance um, with a very small right corner artery. We have a large area at risk since we're doing a left main. Um, it can be considered a complex intervention since it's left main and it's, it's reasonably complex. I, I guess there are more complex situations. Um, there's a large marginal branch, which is at risk. Uh, so that would be pro and contra. Maybe it's not an acute coronary syndrome anymore. Um, so we, we have a little bit of reduced risk of uh, no reflow. Um, we had a recent history of a well tolerate, tolerated, I should have spelled this differently, tolerated PCI. Um, the the, the mid-LAD uh, PCI went without complications and without hemodynamic um, problems. Um, here's a reasonable good and preserved blood pressure. I, I consider this always a good sign. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I had no LVEDP measurement. So um, by that time, um, I had to rely on this more insecure sign, but it's certainly something else if you start with 90. The left main angle was shallow. I think this is nice in this case. We had no relevant valvular heart disease. Uh, the LVF was poor, but not catastrophically poor and calcification uh, was only moderate um, in IVUS. Um, there, is, uh, there is a need for triple therapy, at least until discharge, um, because he has atrial fibrillation and uh, left main stent. So, so this may be also considered an argument against mechanical circulatory support. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the thoughts, of course, here are that we are, you're dealing with left main and um, occlusion of the side branch. Um, in this case, uh, even though the diameter is quite similar, I would consider side branch the circumflex artery. That would be catastrophic. We have a very shallow angle. We have matched LAD and RC, uh, uh, R6 diameter. So I, I decided to have a strategy of a two-stand technique. I, I, I know some of you might not agree with this and um, you would maybe try to get away with one stand or with drug eluting balloon, but we can discuss this later. For me, I decided two-stand technique. Um, we, um, I decided 7F transfemoral because I wanted to have a look at the femoral artery before. <laughs> And also because uh, 7F, um, 7F is a little bit quicker when you do DK crush. Uh, of course, you can do it with 6 French, but for me in such a, well, more risky case, I, I prefer 7F still um, because sometimes you get stuck with, with your devices and then it might be a little bit risky. Um, so my decision was DK crush. And I have to admit, I had an impella in the room. <laughs> Okay, so I just go over the case. Um, this is the first kissing balloon dilatation. Um, 
And uh, I, I use, I still use BMW wires, even though I, I experience more and more people using Cyan Blue, but um, I'm, I'm still quite happy with the BMW. It's just what I'm used to. Didn't switch so far. Um, the first uh, um, stand implantation is, you can see here on the left. So this is uh, first stand and I have a, um, this is a, a 3.520. Um, stand and this uh, is the balloon already in place for the mini crush and on the right you can see the, the mini crush and um, now I'm stuck a little bit okay yeah so this is the um, second kissing balloon dilatation after rewiring and uh, now comes the positioning of the um, stand in the left main LED. Um, I always go for an AP or a slightly cranial, cranial view to get the sizing or the positioning right. Um, I think this was my final choice. And uh, this is the implantation of the stand. And then comes the um, pot on the left. So this is a 4.58 balloon. And uh, on the right is the rewiring. I think you guys would all know that it's important not to wire the, the most distant cell, but go for a more um, medial cell to get the bifurcation nice and clean. And, um, and then um, I performed the sequential high pressure post dilatation first in the circumflex and then in the, in the left um, anterior descending. And then comes the final kissing balloon dilatation and a final pot and uh, and the final uh, result. And there's a bit of recoil here, I think. So I'm not overly proud of this case, but I think it's it's a, still a reasonable result. Check with Ivis once again, and this is the pullback from the uh, circumflex artery. You can appreciate that the stand is round and um, there's um, of course, full adherence and the left main looks reasonably good. And I think this can be better appreciated on the right. This is the pull from the LED. Um, you can also see here in this, in this pullback that um, I think the position of the stand in the left main is good because there's a little bit of protrusion into the aorta, which can be seen hopefully now. Yeah, okay. So um, so this is the before and after picture. I think it's looking it's looking okay given the um, situation of this uh, elderly elderly person. Um, and yeah, so I don't I think it's good. it's, it's important that the left uh, the marginal branch here is basically looking the same. I didn't touch it. I was glad it didn't um, uh, cause any complication or trouble. So this is this is my case, and um, I, I thought I, I just give a simple summary. Uh, it's just a case of a distal left main in a patient with a used ejection fraction. This is an example for a case where um, MCS and standby may have been appropriate. And the simple me messages are: I think it's really important to consider pros and cons before you start the case. And I, I tried to highlight the pros and cons that were in my mind. And of course, it's important to control the risk. So have a look at the uh, femoral artery first, have the impeller maybe in the room, check for, um, yeah, th for the accessibility um, of the femoral artery and decide for a uh, technique where you don't lose the side branch. And I think in this case, for me, this is the DK crush technique. So thank you very much. And I, I really appreciate um, um, the invitation and maybe we can, can discuss for another minute or so. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Tim. That was, was great. And once again, confirming that uh, these cases have not been discussed before, but they all are very complementary and, and different. Uh, and uh, Göttingen seems to be a very nice city. 20% of students must be fun, but they're suffering probably, certainly now. Um, so the, the case is open for discussion. Uh, maybe, uh, Christoph, your uh, your uh, country fellow can make some comments. You're raising a hand, uh, Christoph. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Tim, uh, excellent case. And I think it's, uh, it's wonderful how you led us through the procedure and give us a step-by-step -step approach uh, on how you decided, why you decided, 
mm-hmm. what you did in like uh, one after the other. And uh, I would like to, to stress the fact that you always have to plan ahead. So what, what, can, what is your plan B? Uh, when you think about your your take home messages on the on the on the last slide, uh, what happens with the vascular access? What happens when the hemodynamic crushes? So the MCS is in place. What can you do with uh, with the large bar uh, access? Um, so that's that's very important if you if you think about chip cases that you have always uh, some other um, solution for this. Um, when it comes to like. How would I have tackled this uh, situation in, 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 in this case? Um, I was thinking like on the, on, the, on the first thing, go for one stand maybe, um, keep it simple uh, uh, if possible. Um, and um, maybe just get away with uh, one stand from left main to uh, LID and uh, open up to the, to the circ. Um, two stand, I would, Definitely go for seven French, so that's that's uh, I think that's that's a that's a good way to to go for there. And the other thing is um, I wouldn't have any problems with a with a marginal. Uh, I, you can talk about putting a third wire for the marginal, but it's a ninety degree angle, so I wouldn't be very scared uh, that the marginal will be occluded. Um, and going for a one or two stand, I think it's just. Uh, um, the idea how you tackle these these kind of uh, of uh, diseases. Mm-hmm. It was interesting. I uh, I was lucky to be physically present at the last EBC meeting, European Bifurcation Club, and Sarais showed the ten years data of um, syntax, where two stand strategy came out as an as an independent predictor for mortality. Of course, it's not published yet, but um, it was a quite uh, scary uh, thing to see and a bit a bit counter productive in, in my mind because you know we have to go for two stand strategies sometimes um any comments from the uh from the other panelists i don't see any raised hands maybe comment from me i mean i yeah, I, yeah. I, I really know and it's um I try to force myself to using more one stand techniques, um, but I really find it hard sometimes. And I, whenever I, uh, you know, I see the other guys at PCR or wherever, um, I'm I'm thrilled how how many now push for one stand technique. And um, I think there's really a change in the in the approach going on. Um, and I, I feel I'm a little bit behind, but. <laughs> um, I think this is a stepwise uh, uh, thing to do. I sometimes when I do one stand technique, I'm happy. I'm not happy with the result. Um, then, uh, then you you know you switch back to two stand, and it, I'm sort of in the in the not in the equilibrium. I think of my decision right now. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder whether uh, we ha- we have an, a different experience in five or six years where everyone only uses one stand techniques, and then we uh, you know we. We think we have overdone it a little bit. That's just my um, personal fear. <laughs> maybe let's maybe get the point from our colleagues from Asia. Uh, how is the, how the general spirit in Asia is rather two stand than one stand? I think. Uh, so Alain, uh, you want to make a point? Yeah, yeah Jack. Hola. Yeah. Uh, maybe Holam first. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, for us, uh, I think. Uh, the, in Asia, there's some a uh, trial definition trial. Uh, they has put some criteria. If they fit the criteria uh, properly, you should go for upfront two standing. Uh, that will reduce the maze. Uh, we had just done the complex PCI uh, two days uh, ago uh, in the meeting in Asan. They also changed a little bit on the mind. They in complex two bifurcation. They also uh, suggest to go for upfront to stand strategy. Uh, in my personal experience, I also found that in two publication, that means uh, the osteo uh, had significant lesion. In, in this case, uh, maybe upfront to stand uh, will be better because sometimes once the shirt was closed, uh, it could be a disaster. It's not easy to handle. I mean, you get your point, uh, uh, but surprisingly, if you do physiology in the circ, you're, you're quite surprised sometimes that they turn out to be to be negative. Uh, um, I, I don't know, but it's true. It's, it, today it has become quite 
easy, I would say, to do to stand strategy because we all have learned how to do it. Um, Stan, you want to make a comment? Yes, I a comment. Uh, one, I would say, a possible explanation on the on the poorer poor outcome of double stand, and we also it's also been a big discussion about the fame tree uh, data is the is that in a lot of countries the imaging the coronary imaging is is not routine, routinely done and that also might be something that uh, that has an effect on on longer outcome data mm -hmm. long... yeah that's something you should say to our and colleagues because of course uh, the penetration of imaging and particular eye is high but in in european around, country uh, yeah Definitely. but in a lot of countries it is not that uh, the penetration is not that high huh? The, the, the point is what I see that the younger generation, with all my respect, has not been has not been trained enough in IDIS and it is very keen to OCT, which they do very, very well. Uh, and this is a, an issue, I think, that uh, we need to find a right balance between the two imaging techniques and they are complementary, definitely. Uh, Vincenzo, you have a comment? You have to unmute yourself. Uh, we don't hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, speaking about the optimization of uh, left main PCI results with imaging, uh, I would like to ask the panelists and Dr. Seidler uh, what uh, criteria, what imaging criteria do you use to say, okay, we have a good PCI result to this left main. I personally use the MSA criteria, but recently uh, there is a very nice um, paper uh, on your intervention where they basically use a uh, very uh, straightforward approach which take into account the um, uh, area of, of expansion in comparison to the body of the left main, obviously, in case of distal left main disease. Uh, I would like to know what uh, panelists use as a criteria in this case. That's a good point. Hey, Vincenzo, you, you know, I'm aware of that paper. Practically, I mean, one of the nice things, Eric, you point out about OCT is it gives you percent uh, MSA relative to the reference segments very easily. To do that with IVIS is just slow and painful, where I think the clinical data by Kang criteria for MSA freedom from MACE 5, 6, 7, 8 is really quick and easy. I mean, you can do that in a left main case in a sick patient really quickly. And so as much as percent expansion relative to the body is helpful, it's just, I mean, where do you draw your little circles? You're getting a, a calculator out. Just practically the workflow for MSA seems straightforward. And there is good data from Asia that it is the way to go from an outcome standpoint. The thing we talk about in the U.S., and, and I'll be interested, you know, in Europe, is it the same? Is, you know, a lot of the MSA of 5678 for Kang was developed in an Asian population where people's body sizes may be a little bit smaller. And so... There is a robust conversation around here. If you've got a six foot three person, you know, how do you apply Kang? Should it be different? I think that's where maybe being a little generous in the sizing is something that we at least consider. And so we almost need a, a normalized to body size, right? But that's not something that's going to be easy to get to. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good point. I think uh, definitely something to consider. Yeah. Um, which do you use, Vincenzo? Do you use uh, MSA relative to shaft or do you use MSA strict crop points? I use the second one. And I've started to use actually to upgrade a little bit the, the numbers from the four, yep. five, six, seven, uh, using, I think they are the um, Excel criteria uh, yep. where they just uh, increase a little bit the MSA, which as you mentioned, might be uh, better in non-Asian population. So I, at the moment, I use the six, seven, eight uh, criteria. So, um, but just the MSA, not relatively to the body of the left main. A practical Thank point you. is the balloon sizes. Eh? There, are, there are not so many high, very large uh, NC balloons. Uh, we are limited in size. Uh, don't, don't forget that this may play a role sometimes. Eh? Um, I think we, we need to go on, Jack, if you agree. Uh, yeah. Uh, go to the last speaker. Uh, that will be uh, Dr. Sung when back to Hong Kong. Hello, everyone. Um, do you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. 
Thanks very much. Um, it's an honor to be speaking to you tonight about um, uh, this topic of chip um, high-risk PCI with uh, mechanical circular support, and I really appreciate the invitation. Um, so um, uh, my center in Hong Kong um, serves population of over half a million, and um, somehow um, our patients, when they finally decide to go to the hospital, they are somewhat sacred than the rest of uh, than the average patients in the rest of the city. And uh, we see this kind of um, high-risk emergencies um, who potentially require mechanical support, I think like almost every other day, unfortunately. And um, while we always try to do our best in these cases, um, we we'll always try to explore areas where we could do even better. And um, today I will present a case um, a typical case that we kind of see the day in, day out. And I really appreciate your thoughts about our approach to this kind of high-risk cases. So um, today our patient is a 62-year-old gentleman who had unremarkable past health, who hasn't even smoked before. He came in with chest pain, um, sweating, dizziness for a day. On arrival, his um, blood pressure was 87 over 63. Um, hardware 50, he was already given high fluids and dopamine by the emergency department. Um, his sets were fine on two liters of oxygen. This is his EKG at the emergency department. Um, you can see there's S elevation in uh, inferolateral leads, also with potential posterior extension, and um, the rhythm is the incomplete heart block. So before he came, went to the cath lab, yeah, they put the chest radiograph was clear. Um, a bad side also showed a uh, um, depressed LV stout function with an EF of 30%. Um, there's severe hypokinesia over the inferior posterior wall with LV involvement. The LV stout um, function is also depressed. Uh, the preliminary blood test, the creatinine was normal. Um, the AO2 is slightly high. Um, creatinine is already up. Uh, the lactate was still normal. So he was urgently transferred to the cath lab. Um, so we established a six French right thermal vein access for the tempor uh, temporary pacing. And then we uh, established seven French right thermal access um, for the intervention. Um, his blood pressure went for the, a little uh, lower, um, down to 80 over 40, requiring two inotropes. Um, stats were still fine. We quickly uh, obtained the LVDP was 20, not too bad, but so certainly elevated. So um, this is um, the left side angiogram. So um, to our horror, um, while this is an inferior uh, intro posterior STEMI, um, the LED is occluded. And on the right side, well, without much surprise, the RC is also occluded. Mm. So what's going through uh, our minds at this uh, time point. So first of all, is this patient in cardiogenic shock? I think by any criteria, this patient is in cardiogenic shock and, and even very likely a by, by ventricular failure. Um, we did not have time um, uh, for a complete right heart cath, uh, but ideally we would have uh, would prefer to have those numbers, but um, we certainly did not have the luxury of time here. Um, so let let's count the number of things that we need to do here. So first of all, of, um, I think everyone would agree we need to do a PCI here, um, potentially two vessel um, PCI, and uh, they are not exactly um, very complex anatomy. So we um, estimated about maybe 20 minutes will be enough for a very quick PCI. Of course, we're not going for perfection here, uh, but just a restoration of flow and a deployment of stents here. Um, Impella could be ready, uh, readily available in our cath lab, and it would take maybe just 15 minutes to deploy the impella. Um, ECMO would take a little longer because uh, we need to summon our ICU colleagues um, uh, for initiation of ECMO and certainly take more time than impella. And in this particular patient, um, this in cardiogenic shock, um, acute myocardial infarction, uh, two vessel disease by ventricular failure, he would very likely need um, simultaneous deployment of impella plus an ACMO here. So we thought about this and we think, um, well, the patient's blood pressure is still uh, present. So um, 
uh, given the, uh, uh, the expected time that we need for uh, support, it would probably be better if we just go uh, straight to PCI too. And so this is what we did. Um, so uh, we went to the RSA first, because we believe that's uh, the ultimate um, culprit here. So we wired it um, with the workhorse wire and just quickly deploy uh, a 2540 stand, uh, stand here. It's certainly undersized, but um, we just want to restore the flow group first. And we didn't even have the luxury of um, doing um, imaging here because of uh, the patient status. Uh, and then we quickly moved on to the LED, we wired it, uh, balloon it with a 2.0 balloon, and then we quickly deployed to um, two five stand, long stands here. And then the flow was fine. And after that, um, uh, we uh, decided to move forward with uh, support. And so we uh, deploy an ECMO here, and then we also put in Ampella here. So just for your information here, we were using a Impella 2.5, but obviously that is not ideal given the situation of the patient. And from then on, our, um, our center has moved on to um, routinely employ, uh, uh, deploy a Impella C with smart assist. We've kind of, um, we got rid of all the Impella 2.5 because it's not worth it. Um, the, the, the exercise is marginally smaller, but the support is usually not adequate for this kind of patients. So um, uh, the patient actually survived um, the procedure. He did not uh, need any intubation, um, even with the ECPELA. Um, his organ perfusion was maintained by the support. The lactate did eventually go up after um, repeated testing, but it also got cleared um, uh, two days later. We repeated the echo um, on day three. With the ECMO on the elbow solid function, uh, injection pressure of 15%, still a reasonable um, abnormality. Uh, after reducing the, the ECMO flow, uh, the LVF actually improved uh, on both sides. So um, since um, uh, our uh, uh, index PCI was uh, pretty inadequate, um, uh, we did not actually optimize the sense and we did not do any imaging. So we did a, decided to bring the patient back on day four. And uh, the plan was to puncture through the, uh, the ECMO return cannula, do the PCI. We'll use the same French radio sheath and um, we can see the procedure here. So uh, you can see we were um, trying to disinfect this part of the ECMO cannula. Well, ideally, if you want to keep the impella after the PCI, you should puncture here. But we're pretty confident with the improvement in the patient's hemodynamic. Um, we could uh, wean off the ECMO after this PCI. So we actually did uh, puncture more proximally to give us more working length. And um, uh, we use the radio sheath because um, uh, with a tapered tip, it's uh, easier to get it through the cannula here. And then we uh, went on to do the PCI. The PCI itself is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, we wired the RCA again. Um, fortunately, uh, despite the undersize of the, the stents, uh, we were able to wire it through the stents. And you can see um, there's either some geographic mist distally to where we put our stent and uh, or there could be some, some stand edge problems. So we added another stent distally and we optimized it with an IVIS. And then um, we went on to do, um, to look at the LED. Um, we did not need any um, additional stands here, but uh, we optimized the stand with um, IVIS. And uh, the LED looked fine. And then uh, we just moved on to, um, you know, the, the ECMO and we closed the groin with uh, a Mensa here. So uh, we're, um, we gave the patient some more time after weaning off the ECMO and uh, we managed to wean off the Impella four days later. We initiated medical therapy for his heart failure. Um, his echo before discharge EF was about 30 to 35, but um, we're happy that he actually survived uh, the submission, given him um, uh, 
how he presented initially. So at the end of the case, would ask herself again, um, for this kind of cardiogenic shock complicating myocardial infarction, um, how do we decide on use, uh, using a mechanical support? So of course, the first question would be um, who? Um, how do we select these patients? Um, which patients should, uh, should, uh, would require uh, mechanical support and who, do, uh, who, who don't? And um, of course, we go back to um, the sky stages cardiogenic shock here. Our patient is certainly coming in with a classic cardiogenic shock and, um, and probably moving towards the direction of deteriorating stage D cardiogenic shock here. And if we have to consider the factors, um, there is no general guidelines here, but there are um, uh, many papers uh, which suggest some set of cri uh, criteria of factors that we should bear in our mind. And um, for example, the anatomy, uh, the cornea anatomy, uh, and also like um, peripheral uh, arterial system, the patient comorbidities and the hemodynamics, all of which have been covered by the previous speakers and our panelists here. And, and I think without question, like um, our case here certainly deserves um, kind of support. So the next question here is when, like um, the, the timing of initiating the support, uh, should it be before the PCI or after the PCI? And we do not have uh, prospective randomized controlled trial data here, but registry data rarely shown if we initiate the device uh, before PCI, it's often associated with better outcome. But then we have to ask the next question is how quick can we deploy that support here? How readily available are they? Um, and I think this question, the answer to this question would be different from center to center. And, um, and, and, and for example, like um, in our center, um, we do not have um, a tandem heart, we do not have impeller RP, so if we need biventricular support, the only thing we could do is to, uh, do an actella. And many other centers probably do not have the luxury. Uh, so, so the answer to this question would be um, variable and uh, uh, it would be difficult to, to just like set a um, fixed answer guideline for everyone. So, um, and we also need to consider the anatomy of uh, the, the coronary system. If we can actually do the PCI way quicker than uh, deploying the support, then we should probably consider just doing the PCI first. And in this uh, scenario, we are facing by ventricular failure. And I'm sure everyone would agree, um, it, it's definitely associated with high in hospital mortality here. And um, Studies have shown a simultaneous deployment of biofactor support is uh, usually associated with an improved survival. And on the other hand, if we just deploy left side support, in these cases, um, it's less than ideal because uh, a left support, left uh, LV support alone would usually further worsen the RV function in these cases, um, usually with um, a left shift of the interventricular uh, uh, septum and also an increased venous return. So um, in these cases, we should consider simultaneous uh, deployment of um, left side and right side support. And what options do we have here? So um, in this case, we use Acpella, Acpella with Impella. Um, if available, we can consider tandem or bivet. Bipella is also possible um, with an Impella RP for the right side and impel CP for the left side. And uh, if available, we can also consider um, protect dual RVED for the right side and then impel on the left side. So it really depends what kind of uh, support device uh, you have um, at your disposal. So um, I think there are several discussion points here. So uh, first of all, the, the use of mechanical support in these patients with um, acute myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, biventricular failure. And um, I think uh, there, is, there shouldn't be much question about whether this, this kind of patients uh, require an MCS, but it's more the timing in which MCS we should use. And um, while uh, it's, easier, it's easy to say that um, it's better to deploy early than late, but um, when you're dealing with the real cases there, you need to think about the availability, the availability or, um, 
folks devise um, how quickly you can deploy it versus how quickly you can complete the PCI. And uh, there are certainly a lot of factors that you need to consider, the corneal anatomy, the hemodynamics. Um, I think uh, one factor that many people might um, forget is also the risk of the, uh, using these and uh, mechanical support, um, which um, Dr. Gross has, uh, has um, pointed out earlier in his keynote lecture. Um, I remember at the beginning of my fellowship year in Brigham, um, Dr. Cruz would be, uh, was very meticulous with the way I obtain my groin access. And um, with more cases under my belt, I very quickly realize and understand why he's doing this because um, even if, uh, if you cannot obtain a perfect access um, in an elective six French groin, then um, there's no way you can do it in an emergency uh, situation where you need to establish um, a large board access quickly and uh, precisely. So we, we need to gather this, this experience even um, in our elective cases. And um, if we're unable to deal with um, the complications um, uh, arising from um, the access side, then we should think twice whether we would um, uh, deploy a mechanical support in, a, in your patient. And of course, the time is uh, a very important factor. And um, that's the end of my presentation and I very much love to um, hear your thoughts about this case. Thanks, uh, Thank you. thanks, Jonathan. That was again a great case. You brought up so many points for discussion. I don't know where to start actually. You, you have a simultaneous two territory MI, you've got issues with discussion for excess timing, bioventricular failure. I would like to ask Kelvin to give his, uh, Kevin to give his comments and uh, maybe your thoughts on the teaching points for Jonathan's case first. Yeah, well, um, it's, it, first of all, you know, ha having fellows is kind of like having children and watching them grow up and do great things makes you proud. So it's just really nice to catch up with Jonathan and see that the things he learned at his center before he came to us and in some part from my colleagues is now being employed. It's an amazing case, Jonathan. I think, you know, the patient was lucky to have you and your team take part in care because, you know, without deliberate and certain action, we all know the outcome could have been very different. Um, there are so many robust teaching points in what you showed. I think, you know, alternative access with ECMO in is something which is relatively new. And I even had some questions about that. I was asking in the chat in terms of, you know, would an Asahi OCAF work if you needed bigger bore, sort of the ways to do that, I think is evolving. And so you show a very nice example of a little bit of an ingenious way to use the current access to get the case done. And, and we're very fond of that, as you know, because we use a lot of single access with Impella when we have it in. So you can do similar stuff with ECMO. You can also put a TUI on the um, port of the ECMO and use that as a way to get a wire in if you want to maintain wire access. So there's lots of even current evolution with regard to ways to preserve, keep, and use access with MCS, which are um, becoming, you know, new and evolving almost monthly. And, and although a lot of the stuff we see on Twitter is sometimes not accurate and not right, one of the nice aspects about that venue is we can learn from each other very quickly that way. And so that's a really cool demonstration. The other thing which you, you didn't bring up too much, Jonathan, is I think the data suggests that early implementation of LV venting for ECMO patients is associated in observational studies with a mortality benefit. And so the fact that you know you vented the LV early on in a shock patient, I think seems to have value with regard to less LV ballooning, less pulmonary edema, and probably helps with myocardial recovery in time. And so that's another nice teaching point here. But I think you know there are so many robust aspects of this case that can be discussed. Those are the ones that were at the top of my mind as I watched you go through it. So congratulations and thank you for sharing it. Thanks, Thanks very much, Kevin. Um, yes, um, indeed, for most of our ECMO cases now, we, um, unless there is a contraindication or there's other issue, uh, we usually deploy um, an Impella uh, for LV venting in these ECMO cases. But of course, there's um, other complicated issues in Hong Kong, such as the reimbursement issue. Not everyone um, could get an Impella. So, um, but you're right, like um, for most ECMO cases now, we try to do LV venting with an Impella. Anyone with uh, any final questions for Jonathan's case or comments? Okay, no, I, I think we've overrun the time, but uh, it, was, it was great. Uh, I'd like to first uh, close the session by thanking uh, all the speakers. We have 
a great starting lecture by Kevin. Too bad we didn't manage to finish up the lecture, but it was a great uh, starting reference point. And I would like to thank all the respective uh, presenters, uh, Kalang, Haobang, Sydney, Tim, and Jonathan. Their cases were all, we all agree, were cheap cases, but they're all different. So a few things that crossed my mind as a summary is firstly, I don't think we're ever going to get a trial that address all these issues. You saw that all the chip we presented had Shaw, had AS, had a lot of different type of comorbidity, different type of bleeding risk. So I'm not too sure whether any trial can possibly address all these issues. So this kind of forum is probably the best for us to cross learn and uh, get some tips and tricks uh, rapidly. Second part is that I heard a lot about discussion. So I think if your center wants to do a chip, it's quite difficult to work alone. I, I really, uh, really empathize with Hao Pang's uh, situation when you have to be a single operator sometimes. So I, I think if you want to, you should really get a team on board so that you always have that team to help you come to a decision a bit faster. And they are also there to support you, whether it's a surgeon, the anesthetist, another second experience operator. Thirdly, the other thing I heard was speed. So speed comes, I think, not with fast hands, but with experience and some gray hairs, I think. So I, I really appreciated some of the decision-making in the cases uh, showed by actually um, Sydney, as well as uh, Hao Bang and the rest. I mean, they, they did cases and they finished it off with ways that I never imagined. So I think it takes a lot of experience to do those cases and do it fast and neatly. The third, last one I would say would be imaging. I think Vincentio spoke a lot about imaging. I think you want to do complex cases, understanding imaging, understanding imaging end result, and doing it routinely is really a must in nowadays, especially if you want to do a left main intervention. So I think we still need a little bit more experience and to do it well. I think human dynamic support in my mind, I'm still not absolutely certain actually whether you do need it in routinely all cases. Um, but I think the judgment is the difficult part. If you do have it in, I think you can do a bit more com uh, complete case, but I'm, I'm still don't quite have a grasp about how to upfront titrate and whether you combine it with ANGMO, APELA, when is it necessary or not necessary. So these are some of the things that I think we we'll continue to learn from each other. So, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their time and staying with us to the end. I think we have a great uh, session today. I uh, look forward to the next uh, test session in conjunction with APSC and TEST. Thank you very much and have a great uh, weekend ahead. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 See you next year. <laughs> See you next year. Thank you. <laughs> we're going to have a Christmas party. Merry Christmas. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay, bye. Merry Christmas, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.